Boa noite. Good evening. Very well. Let's start another plenary session of our NIEP meeting. First of all, I would like to make some general announcements before we convene our work. The first announcement is that the NIEP t-shirts are being sold tomorrow. They will be sold tomorrow and I recommend to for advertising. I'm using one of these t-shirts as you can see. But the uh, T-shirts has uh, certain uh, quotes from Marx, and it helps to fund our symposium. And I recommend you all to buy the T-shirt because it's very cool. Well, the second announcement is that there's a change in the schedule for Friday. The cultural activity was anticipated for 1 o'clock in the afternoon, so it's going to be from 1 to 2.30 in the afternoon for a theatrical company that they will pre uh, present the play The Ten Days That Shook the World. The ten Days That Shocked the World. Uh, the mini course will start 2.30 in the afternoon till 6.30 here at the Auditorium F. From 6.30 to 7 o'clock, we will have a release of many books here at the F Auditorium, and at 7.30 p.m., we will have a party here uh, in the Faculty Members Club, and we'll, we'll have autograph sessions, and books will be released during the party. So these were the announcements. Natalia, that is from the theater play, she wants to talk a little bit about the play. Let's give the floor to Natalia. Good evening. I'm sorry to interrupt the symposium. As he said, Friday we're going to be here with a theatrical play and that we are now we will we'll be showing the 10 days that shocked the world based on John Reed's book, but the play will also approach a little bit before the revolution, the Russian revolution, since the, the Chisar regime till the February revolution, till the October revolution, and today Outside, we already are selling tickets for our p theater play. It's part of the event, and so we, it will be, the theater play will happen in Rio and uh, for its regular presentations. And so for those that are interested, we have a promotional tickets and they cost 50 reais and we're giving a uh, 80% to uh, 20 reais that we're selling with a deduction. And so at the end, if you want to buy, purchase the theater tickets and Friday, we'll have some tickets too. Thank you very much for this announcement. Before we open our plan, we're going to start our release of our dear colleague Mauricio Martins that is here with us in the NIEP collection. It's the third volume of the NIEP collection and Mauricio also wants just to ma uh, mention brief words, say some brief words. Uh, good evening to all. One of my colleagues from NIEP requested me for me to make a presentation in a synthetic way about my book. I weighed that it, that would not be the proper moment. We have national and international guests at the round table now today, and they said no. It's a collection. It's my collection on Marx, and in its third volume, the first two volumes were collections of many different participants of the group, and the proposal is to publicize not a collective work of NIEP, yes, also to publicize more individually from their participants. And so, I'm going only to give you a very brief idea. Marx and Spinoza and Darwin, these are thinkers of imminence. And so, two points that I would like to highlight. The first one is in the book's title, Why uh, Imminent Thinkers. It's an attempt 
to get closer to this uh, imminent concept, which is a concept of, of the world that does not accept the resource of s uh, some transcendent uh, form to explain a uh, phenomenon of the world, of the daily life. And to remind that this transcendent uh, thought uh, duplicates the world uh, affirming the existence of another world that supposedly uh, over our world and it would supply a measurement a yard, an adequate yard for us to visualize what is going on in our daily lives and so this is a metaphysical structure a basic fundamental metaphysics that f infiltrates in our thought even when we're not we don't see it very clearly that we are triggering uh, a old metaphysic uh, resource. So Marx and Spinoza and Darwin, uh, with the, the proper caveat, the substantial caveat that exists between these two thinkers, they went to, against this perspective, metaphysical perspective, and Spinoza was thrown out of the Amsterdam synagogue of heresy, and he used to say that to use God's wish is ignorance. It's an evasion from the reality of the difficulties that happen, and so this is to an eminent uh, explanation. As to Darwin, Darwin, he delayed for many years the publication of his book, The Origin of the Species, that he was aware of the resistance that his work would face. In a letter to his friend Joseph Rooker, he writes, Now I am convinced finally that the species are transforming themselves. And this is like confess assassination. To confess assassination is a very strong expression. And today we see that probably he had made some mistake that today continues to generate effects of resistance even in the 21st century. Now in Marx, in a, the young Marx text, he says that the critique of the religion is the, precip is the assumption of any critique. That's also a strong statement that has a meaning that, uh, that is linked to a program and that uh, indicates an ethical position of assuming a uh, uh, a uh, human world and a mundane world. Very early Marx works, he found out the risk that would be to transform his own political project, the foundation of a communist society, in a new species or a new kind of religion that would follow the religious perspective, which is a temptation that we face even today. And so that's why Marx emphasized in his writings that he would see the possibility of socialism not as an imperative that would come from outside, that goes against the ethics from Kant, but he sees socialism as a trend, a set of trends that already was happening within the interior of a capitalist society, and this generates important issues of how we can think a, a socialist project. And the second issue refers to the possible role of human action, of human subjects in this eminent uh, cosmos. It's a, a critique directed to Marx as also to Spinoza about the fact that they would have neglected mainly in their theoretical writings the role of what we call today agency, the capacity to act and change structures, and to state an eminent perspective is to dive into a depersonalized cosmo where you would have only impersonal forces in operation. And if we take the example from Hegel, that was a Kant reader, uh, Hegel appreciated Kant. I made a mistake here, says the speaker. I was going to refer to Spinoza and uh, the sentence that I like to construct to Hegel. There was a, a Spinoza reader and uh, I appreciated it. He also read Kant, of course, but uh, Spinoza's thought that Spinoza said, oh, Spinoza, no other philosophy. So it's a very affirmative uh, statement f for that kind of thinker. But the next step from Hegel was to say that there would be an influence 
of the Eastern influence in Spinoza's writings from the Spinoza's uh, concept of, uh, of substance, this would exclude this concept of the individuality of the subjects of their capacity to act, because according to Hegel, the subjects would disappear in the impersonal, as also Shiva will uh, fail in, in the alms of Rama, and then she would go into the unconscious world. We know that this was not a good read that Hegel did on Spinoza, but this generated a school of thought during many years. And the critique that the Spinoza th followers and Marx thought leaves outside the agency, the capacity to act. This is a, a mistaken critique. That's why we have included in the book some chapters that dedicate themselves to discuss a little bit the statue of uh, subjectivity and human action. This is a, a thing that is dear to us, and I believe that today we are always interested in a more pragmatic way to reclaim this capacity capacity of the conscious, the human conscious, to have to undertake collective action to go against the so-called marketplace, which is a fantasy of capital that uh, affects our lives every day. So concluding my presentation, I'd like to thank you very much for this opportunity for my colleagues in EAP Marx for the permanent incentives that they gave and for the environment of a frank exchange of ideas and discussions and Joel and Medeiros. They did a very careful work to review the the original and the publishing house that is publishing this uh, work managed to publish the, uh, materialize the project. So very well, thank you very much and very well. Now I give back the floor to the chair and to our guests that were very anxious to listen to our guests. Thank you. Obrigado, Maurício. Thank you, Mauricio, as always, to uh, make a presentation with such a high quality. Very well, let's start our roundtable. Today we're going to start with the second block of this edition of our meeting. As João said in the beginning, we're, cele uh, we have, we're celebrating first, the, uh, we're celebrating the 150 years anniversary of the volume one of Capital, and we're also celebrating the 100 years of the Soviet Revolution. And our roundtable today and tomorrow, we'll talk about the Russian Revolution. Our roundtable is the episode 1970, 1917. And then afterwards, we have here with the press, uh, President, the Professor Raquel Varela, that will start the first presentation that is from the new University of Lisboa. She's a visiting professor here at the university and she's a colleague at NIAP. So I'll give the floor to Professor Raquel for her presentation. Good evening to all. Thank you very much for my colleagues from NIEP to be part, for inviting me to be part of this group, and they want me as a partner. And really, this is an event that is extraordinary. And I agree uh, with what Professor Alex Kalinikos presented here in the terms of the world Marxism. This is really a highlight here in Brazil. I also like to greet Valerio and Kevin. Maybe this is where I feel better in one of the, in the round tables or hundreds of round tables that have been present today. This is one of the best ones. Uh, Valerio was the one that was, that uh, coached me for my doctorate, uh, and Kevin's wrote one of the most extraordinary books that I ever read in the last few years, which is called Revolution and Counter Revolution, which is the story that he's going to tell us here today. And I'm not going to advance his ideas. Here's uh, work that is magnificent works, and for many years we didn't have the opportunity to be together again. And today I would like to share with you all three words that came from the Russian Revolution, which are first, I think that they're the three best words that we inherit from the Russian Revolution, inherited with a specific content, Soviet 
Oh, Council, a party, the Bolshevik Party, the Revolutionary Party, the Vanguard Party, and the working class, united working class, and not fragmented working class. These are the three basic ideas that today I would like to share with all of you. But I would like to start first by the war. And why do I want to start by the war? Because uh, it is argued systematically that the prognosis of Marxism of the 19th century on the development of capitalism failed that prognosis and they, that prognosis failed because uh, we, we ignore two achievements that were fundamental in the history of mankind that have changed qualitatively. It was not possible in the 19th century to foresee what was the dimension of the barbarian phase of the First and Second World War. And I can ask in a very provocative way to the audience, uh, would we would have capitalism today without the First and Second World War? The First World War uh, 20 million people died and in the Second World War we saw the suicide of a class the German bourgeoisie and the death of 60 million people. The axis of the earth have changed after the Second World War. And so we have uh, in the history books as a reference of the First World War as it was one more historical event. And I would like to stress this issue. It's not just one more an event, but it's the historic event. Together with the Russian Revolution, it marked the whole 20th century. In 1914, England had an empire uh, 114 times its size, Belgium 80 times its size, Holland 60, and France 20 times its size. Between 1850 and 1911, all the world was conquered by the European empires and we can see the history of mankind has flowed to a f narrow channel that was designed by very few countries in Europe. And uh, Chris Harmon, an historian that wrote the history of the people of the world, I'm quoting him, the First World War uh, started in July of the 1914. Everybody was talking about uh, of a quick war. Oh, this is going to end uh, very quickly. This, uh, And it ended out, as we know, with a truce. And the truce was for due to Russian intervention. The truce was not in 1919. The truce actually was achieved in the trenches of the workers as you well know, uh, uh, from peasants mainly. We do not know if we would have one of the deadliest uh, wars compared with other uh, genocides and other wars. I'm not going to go to this inter uh, this polemic, but certainly this was uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, a lot of resistance, organized resistance against the war. Never we organized so much against the war in the history of mankind as there was the resistance against the First World War. We're talking about uh, the People's War that the workers would have gone uh, enthusiastic to the uh, uh, listening to to the trenches of the war. This is not true. The French socialists uh, raised an hypothesis of uh, calling for a general strike in July of 1914 against uh, the war, and his, the leader of the strike was killed, and the strikers in the plants were sent to the front uh, to avoid strikes in Germany. Uh, historical sources show today that the most powerful working class of the Ruhr uh, region, it's still the most working class powerful, uh, most powerful working class in Germany. It's the highest unionized rate that we have in Germany were out of that mission and uh, the Patriot missions and in the US and uh, with the voluntary conception of one million soldiers had a response a voluntary of 70,000 only in the US and so they followed today to have to go to force uh, military services to uh, for the war to recruit for the war there was an easier recruitment than other wars of course I'm not going to go to the polemic of the Second World War, but certainly some facility for the recruiting for the First World War it had to do with the fact that they came from peasants, and that peasants were the majority. Uh, this is another discussion that I would like to uh, release to the audience. The peasants organized themselves against the war, and uh, which is the social base of the Russian Revolution before uh, they were peasants, but they were soldiers before that. And so my issue here, before being soldiers, they were peasants. My issue has been a lot to discuss during the 20th century. The idea that Marxism failed in the, uh, to foresee the centrality of the industrial workers uh, because 
the peasants were major players, but the major peasants' revolution of the 20th century had as protagonists by peasant soldiers or soldier, soldier peasants, and nothing more industrialized, more uh, fabricated, better fact, in a war. And so my issue here that the social base, this social base that reached the truce, the peasants of the Russian Revolution, they're not only peasants, they are uh, peasant soldiers that are so soldier peasants and they uh, were very much strongly linked to the war issue. The resistance uh, to war, against war, that afterwards half of the French troops uh, re rebel in mutiny in 1917. In Italy there's a mutiny uh, and there's, there's many shootings uh, and fire squads against these leaders of the, the of until in the Russian Revolution, as you know, there's also the, the uh, those that deserted for the war and the truce is reached. I also would like to stress that this resistance and in part the conscience of the workers has a history and this history it goes back to the extraordinary development for the first time in the history of a class consciousness of uh, the idea of socialism and it is expressed in some data that I would like to share with all of you obviously from the first uh, revolution in 1905 and then in 1909 the rebellion in Spain and then in, in Italy in 1914 there were other revolts and the generalization of strikes in France, England and Germany between 1910 and 1915 and the wave, unprecedented wave of strikes in England in 1911 and the one million workers that were on strike in Germany in 1912 and in 1914 the trade unions have more than 2,000 workers. Don't forget that uh, unionism, it was forbidden in, in England for many years, which would correspond to 30 percent. But uh, the unionization r rate uh, average in Germany and England would correspond to 30 percent of the labor force in those days. And the war shaked all the fundamentals of society. It brought to the uh, uh, labor market uh, uh, massive workers and it abolished the equation of uh, uh, state is, 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 like, is equal to the people. Internationalism was born with an unprecedented force during the process to, to resist the First World War and during the Russian Revolution. It also shaken all the structures of the state government which I referred to before and changing in a qualitative sense the, all the panorama in Europe, in Russia. In 1917, Lenin stated, the elders, maybe we will not see the battalions, the, the decisive wars of the future revolution. Two months after that, the workers of the most important metal plant in Petrograd go on strike, and one week after that strike, it transform itself in a general strike in Russia in June. July, the Bolsheviks in July had 13% of the Soviets. Three months after that, they had 45% to 60%. This is the speed of the Russian Revolution in the qualitative sense. How's it changed the quality of, of the panorama in Europe? I'm not going to talk about the re revolution because there are two people here on this round table that know how to do it much better than I can do it. I'm just going to skip the Russian revolution here, my presentation, to go to the counter-revolution and the place of the Russian revolution. The Russian revolution, uh, by the beautiful words of Kajola, it gave everything that it could. And everything that it could I would like to underpin this, uh, this uh, issue that is so important. The peasant Russia would produce, in the turn of the 19th century to the 20th century, one-fourth less than the British agriculture and one-third less than the output, agriculture output in Germany. So it, it, it needed the 20th century that would reach the production of 1914. And so the Russian Revolution started uh, uh, not on the hypothesis of socialism because it was lagging behind. They needed the, the development of productive forces. You 
you understand that in a concrete case? You need machines, you need, you know how to do things. You, in Russia, there was no expertise, nothing on that. On the contrary, it was a country that was devastated. Now, writing about the Civil War, Victor Serge, an intellectual that was uh, the leader of the Inter uh, Communist International, uh, he reminds the following, that it was not the 14 foreign armies that demoralized us, it was typhus and hunger and starvation. And so, the most important note and Lenin will write in a phrase I don't remember, but I'm going to quote it by heart. Uh, we were very sad. It, we were unlucky to start in a revolution in a country that was late in its development. And so this will start the counter-revolution of Stalin from the 30s onwards. And it has its origin due to this fact. The bureaucracy that is installed during the Stalin period and that makes that the Soviets are not uh, uh, factory committees that was the most powerful uh, body and now it becomes the boss, so the political boss, the, uh, which undermines the plant power from 1927-28 onwards. And uh, then we have the secret police chief and then you start distributing free broad and that replace something that didn't exist before, which was the Soviets. But all that, or the factory committees, this is all the developed of the defeat of the Russian Revolution, of the revolution in, in the European countries, in the central countries. And this is an unquestionable issue today, as we see it. Russia was, in fact, a late, a late developed country, and the bureaucracy is the result of that late development. All the works of uh, uh, history in Russia are written before 1937 and were forbidden to circulate and you would, could be arrested if, uh, according to the law. During the 17th Congress, Kaganovich offered a, pr a proof, an unquestionable proof of the bureaucratization when he indicated that the uh, train wagon Moscow plant, uh, 601 managers they had in that plant, 367 are split in 14 uh, central services and 344 in different workshops of a total of 3,000 workers in that plan. So if you have an idea what it means, the bureaucratization of a country. We have less than 4,000 workers where you have 601 managers in that plant. And I, this is one of the best books that I ever read in my lift, the case of the Todorov uh, case from Victor Serge. Uh, Christopher Hitchens uh, say the same thing that, that I say here. It's the counter-revolution, and Victor Serge, he develops in his novel the uh, thesis of the counter-revolution in Russia uh, from the 1930s, the dark years. First they were expropriated and then deported. I would like to mention here that there's something that uh, people tend to forget, that the US Soviet Union will be, before Nazism, the country that will use forced labor, mass forced labor. Victor Serge here ironizes in a certain way, there's no problem. We have many XY number of railroad roads to build. We have 100,000 prisoners so that we can use them. So the forced collectivization is, happens at the same time with the enforced incarceration of thousands of workers that are prisoners in, in camps with the excuse, of course, there was excuse, it was uh, Trotskites, uh, whatever was the excuse to arrest them, but what we want to say is that to forget the demographic dimensions, the industrialization uh, based on forced labor that is typical of the uh, accumulation process using uh, labor force. For those that study as well, this is Titkin that develops the demographic issue and the work issue, the labor force issue in, in the Soviet 
Soviet unions and the very low levels of productivity that you had in Soviet Union expropriated first and then deported expropriated that is uh, what he refers to the peasants that, were, that lost their land 7% of the uh, agricultural workers uh, abandoned their land and and with the curses of the children and the cries of the woman and the crazy uh, that she's quoting the book we don't have the copy that she's reading and so we have all the problems to feed the animals there was no sugar no gasoline and nothing and no clothes and shoes and all everywhere we can see uh, the pale faces that we see and we can see the disease spread out uh, security decimated all the agricultural services the transportation services the supply service of food the Central Committee recommended the creation of to raise or to breed rabbits and the rabbit will be uh, the basic of uh, food for them and the local governments from the Central Committee of Macavro, the only ones not to adhere, adhere to this the idea because they received food. Well, even the rabbit needs to be feeded before you eat the rabbit, as Mike has said. Well, Victor Sashi says that the only plan that worked in the Soviet Union was the one to arrest because all the other plans and the, the, uh, the statistics for development were forged with the exception, of course, of the uh, uh, plan to arrest. Now I have found the Lenin's roads. It's a great uh, forge that to, to first socialist revolution happened uh, to come to people that has uh, the, uh, suffered the late development in Europe. I'd like to go back to the beginning, uh, thinking these two words, that the, what the revolution left, are the three ideas that we should be proud of. Soviet. Soviet. And uh, I want to remember this word Soviet, to, to telling you a story. I'm very tall. Yeah, I'm hurting my neck here because I'm very tall. Leningrad was uh, surrounded by the Nazi troops between 1941 and 1944, at the end of 43. I don't remember that by heart, so we're talking about 900 days, three, day, three years. In Leningrad, Leningrad, as you said, the, the bread ration to the workers, because for the children it was even less, it was being successively being diminished, uh, 600 grams uh, to 120 grams per day during decades. Uh, during decades, the, the story was told that the Russians, the barbarians, surrounded by the Nazi troops, they practice in mass cannibalism. And you know what we know in an uncontested way today? That it, it, was, uh, it was the only time that Stalin suspended the terror regime and the Soviets came back because Leningrad was surrounded. And the only way to guarantee that to uh, face that aggression that will not end up in cannibalism where 100,000 people died per month in that winter of 42 was to authorize that the Soviets would come back to be the basis of the power of the cities. And today we know that cannibalism was very strong in Leningrad, or not so strong in Leningrad. Uh, there were about 3,000 cases, and they even classified different types of cannibalism. But it's the way you eat the person, whether you kill them to eat or you eat corpses that have been dead for a long time. But anyway, going back to the exciting story is that these Soviets or councils were responsible for distributing the bread rations. And with that, they were able to prevent cannibalism from spreading out, from disseminating. And this is proof that 
to produce a revolution, you need councils. And to resist and to build a society, you need these councils or Soviets. And it's not even to produce or to make revolution. It's to live in society or in community. You, have, you need to have this organization because what we had that was very strong enables us to control those on the top. And this is something that we deserve to have permanently, revolutionary and non-revolutionary institutions. The idea that we can have honest rulers who are not subjected to a control coming from the bottom, well, the problem in the society and the workplace is is that power comes from the top and not from the bottom up. We need discipline. And discipline helps us to be organized. But in capitalism, you go to the workplace and you are ruled from the top down. And when you have the councils or Soviets, it comes from the bottom up. I studied the Portuguese revolution and I saw the, how they were organized with uh, very big assemblies, day and night, working. And a friend of mine, a doctor, uh, he was asked, why did you op operate so many appendicitis and no hernias? It's because of the instruments he had at hand. So if managers believe that they can predict the kind of surgery that will happen most if he, they're idiots, so they ask the doctor, what's going on here? And uh, as a matter of fact, the surgeon is a friend of mine. He was in exile. He, of course, should have punched him in the face after hearing that question, but he answered. He was so shocked that he answered. And he said, but the children arrived here with acute appendicitis. That's what I had to operate on. Be but they had received the instruments for hernias and they needed to use that material. Well, anyway, this is a story I told, but the basic idea is that we need the councils or Soviets. This is one of the main legacies of the Russian Revolution. The second, naturally, is the idea of a party. A party because it is unanimous that in Russia they could only uh, take power because they had the Bolshevik party and with its characteristics. And it is unanimous related to the Russian Revolution, but we don't... But maybe we don't think right because nowadays, as you know, uh, to be part of a revolutionary party is not the first, not even the 20th priority for most intellectuals. And this is very sad, by the way, because obviously what the Russian Revolution teaches us, like other revolutions, the Italian, is that without a revolutionary party, the working class cannot change the social and production relationships. This is a key idea that is part of the legacy of the Russian Revolution, and I believe that Kevin and Valerio will elaborate on that. And I will now focus on my last point, which is class. I believe that one of the basic points in the Russian Revolution is the idea of a united and not fragmented class. And it's not by chance that I am focusing on this topic now, because women in the Bolshevik party, they did not lead women. They led the whole party. Rose, Rosa Luxemburg, by the way, said it was very boring to go to women's meetings. And she wouldn't go. And she it, led women and men, because she led the working class. 
And this doesn't mean that we will not go into false controversies, that there is no specificity in organizing se sectors. Of course there is. But it means that in the political viewpoint, the Bolshevik party resisted fragmentation. It resisted the fragmentation uh, from, of the peasants, of the Jews, religious fragmentation, gender fragmentation, and they were able to build unity. I brought this reflection. I brought a book that I appreciate by Dick Barry, a British author. He reflects upon the movement in the first 30, 30 years of Europe. And he says, what happened in Russia that did not happen in the other countries? More poverty? Well, the Bolshevik party is what we could call a uh, workers' aristocracy. Although we always go back to the vanguard party organized through its newspapers among the workers class. This is the idea of vanguard. It's not what we hear today. <coughs> so he says, it's not a matter of poverty. The political engagement of the European working class in their parties was not determined by poverty. And he goes on to this hypothesis that I think it's very in interesting for us to reflect upon today. He says, Russia is the only country where the workers' movement is not um, fragmented by gender, uh, sectorial, and even more important, the division between intellectual and manual work. As you know, uh, the the unskilled workers were greatly discriminated and a big part of male chauvinism at the time, uh, especially against women, came from the fact that they were not skilled and not from the fact that they were women. And this implies in competition because if a woman or a man who works less or is less skilled and goes into the job market, the trend is uh, broken down because there needs to be competition among workers. And he says that this was functional. It was fundamental for Europe, this difference, because in Western Europe the fragmentation was religious. That is, the uh, party uh, trade union structures looked for religious um, structures, which is very s strong in Northern Europe. Europe and not particularly in the South and the Bolshevik party witnessed that and this was in fact my last comment about the place of Russian Revolution because I think that this uh, fragmentation of the working class is one of the issues that has been contributing the most to divide us nowadays. And I conclude with a proposal of a Russian revolution that is revolutionary. So let us remember what revolutionary means. The idea that we're going to uh, split housework between men and women. And I would say that I don't want to do this because uh, housework is very boring and I will not make love to my uh, boyfriend uh, after spending the whole day cleaning house and cooking. And the Russian revolution is socialization of the uh, housework. This is revolutionary. A revolutionary measure is not let's compete all, all along the day to see who works four hours in the house because of course will all have to work at least four hours in the house. And I want to conclude with this because I think that we need to go back to the Russian Revolution. We need to go back to the proposals of uh, organizing uh, workers independent of gender and go back to the Russian proposals that are so socialist and not liberal. Our proposals are socialist and these proposals aim at releasing us from work and not making hell of our lives and making us uh, hate each other. This is the place of the Russian Revolution, that is.
It is the legacy of freedom, of the increased productivity, of the freedom that is allowed, and only because of that, of equality. Thank you very much, and uh, long live Russia, or the Russian Revolution. <laughs> Thank you, Raquel. I will now give the floor to uh, Professor Kevin Murphy from the University of Massachusetts. Professor Kevin is the author of Revolution, Counter-Revolution uh, in the Moscow Metalworks or Metal Factory, and he his conference has the title The Development of Working Class Consciousness in the Russian Revolution. I give the floor to Professor Kevin. Eu gostaria de, de começar, é uma honra estar aqui com vocês, aqui com Raquel e Valéria. Eu me lembro, oito meses atrás, que eu recebi esse e-mail de, de, dizendo, você gostaria de ir ao Rio de Janeiro e fazer uma apresentação sobre a Revolução Russa? E eu devo dizer que eu fui criado como católico e me separei do catolicismo quando eu era bem jovem, mas eu fiquei muito impressionado que eu recebi um e-mail, um convite desse tipo, para ir ao Rio de Janeiro e falar sobre a Revolução Russa. Que honra que foi receber esse convite. Bem, então o que eu gostaria de fazer hoje à noite é falar sobre o desenvolvimento da consciência de classe dos trabalhadores desde 1905 até 1917, o período da Revolução Russa. E no segundo congresso dos soviéticos, convocados no dia 25 de outubro, 505 dos 670 delegados votaram para transferir todo o poder aos soviéticos. Para mim, esse é um dos eventos mais importantes da Revolução Russa, que conscientemente e decisivamente os representantes da classe trabalhadora e dos soldados votaram contra o capitalismo e pelo socialismo. Mas se nós voltarmos agora para os movimentos, antes disso, o movimento no local de trabalho foi dominado principalmente por sindicatos policiais que achavam que os tissados eram benevolentes e os socialistas, na verdade, estavam à beira de um desastre. Não havia muita influência da esquerda revolucionária até 1905. Portanto, o que eu gostaria de fazer é falar de como é que a classe trabalhadora se tornou uma classe para si. Há uma transformação muito grande acontecendo nesse período de, de ser pró-tesaristas, nesses né, poucos anos, mas não apenas a favor do capitalismo e mudar para o socialismo. Como é que aconteceu essa mudança de ideias? E, com o risco de generalizar, eu quero ver aqui o desenvolvimento desse trabalho, de desenvolvimento da classe, de consciência de classe, ver alguns exemplos cruciais que aconteceram antes de 1917, e depois, por uma parte, focalizando no ano de 1917, quando uma série de eventos acontecem com mais força. Bem, para ter uma ideia do contorno geral do movimento da classe trabalhadora na Rússia, nós vamos ver o movimento de greves. Na verdade, nós tivemos três ondas de greves muito fortes de 1900 até 1917. Três ondas de greves muito grandes. A primeira ápice foi na Revolução de 1905, quando 2,8 milhões de trabalhadores foram entrar em greves. A segunda onda de greves atingiu o seu pico poucos meses antes da guerra, quando cerca de 1,3 milhões de trabalhadores entraram em greve nos primeiros sete meses. Portanto, o ritmo da radicalização e raiva dos trabalhadores antes da Primeira Guerra Mundial foi quase do mesmo nível de 1905. E a terceira onda, então, obviamente, em 1917, quando você tem uma outra onda grande de greves, mas nós temos que ver o lado negativo, e um dos pontos negativos dessas três ondas de greve, a primeira foi em 1904, que começou com o primeiro ano da guerra russo-japonesa. O último ponto ruim foi em 1909 e 10, durante a repressão que se seguiu depois da Revolução de 19 e depois um outro problema de queda das greves foi no começo da guerra de 1914. Mas o ponto que eu quero é, ressaltar aqui é que os trabalhadores 
você vê de poucos milhares de trabalhadores para vários milhões nessas grandes ondas de greves e que os trabalhadores estavam muito conscientes do que estava acontecendo no mundo. Não é algo que os trabalhadores não se importassem com a Primeira Guerra Mundial ou com outros eventos importantes. Não, eles tinham consciência do que estava acontecendo. Uma multitude de divisões, de diferentes formas de repressão, dividiu os trabalhadores russos. Essa é uma das questões que Raquel estava abordando aqui antes e ela mencionou essa multitude de divisões e formas diferentes. Eu acho que é verdadeiro em qualquer sociedade. Você sempre vai ter divisões dentro da classe trabalhadora. E eu queria falar um pouquinho sobre a situação de uma fábrica que eu estudei. Nós tínhamos uma divisão na fábrica em diferentes unidades de produção ou oficinas de trabalho. E naquela época as greves só aconteciam em certos locais de trabalho e havia uma divisão que estava sediada. Em inglês nós chamamos uma oficina de trabalho, né, um chão de fábrica e uma, uma unidade no chão de fábrica. E uma determinada oficina baseada também em trabalho especializado em certas cidades dentro da Rússia tinha certas habilidades de artesanato em que era uma espécie de lealdade baseada de onde você vinha e que habilidade você tinha como artesão e agora trabalhando numa fábrica. Então, a qualificação e o nível ideológico variava muito no local do trabalho e as práticas também, mas muitas greves foram por razões econômicas, mas políticas, limitadas a uma ou duas oficinas no chão de fábrica, havia uma divisão entre trabalhadores qualificados e não qualificados e talvez durante a Revolução Russa também nós sempre tivemos um grau de nacionalismo, formas diferentes de nacionalismo e quão forte foi o nacionalismo mudou em diferentes períodos, mas essa palavra nacionalismo russo na fábrica era muito importante, é claro que nós também tínhamos afiliações políticas muito diferenciadas dentro da fábrica. Isso se torna muito importante em 1905. Eu quero dizer que, que parte da, do tizarismo em 1905, isso eram, é, havia pontos fortes dentro da classe trabalhadora. Bem, as primeiras organizações marxistas na Rússia organizadas eram marginalizadas da classe trabalhadora. A a a o grupo de emancipação do trabalho, fundado por Pleca 9 em 1883, existia apenas como organização de imigrantes é, nos seus primeiros 10 anos de existência e tinha pouca ligação com a classe trabalhadora. E, de fato, a primeira organização socialista que tinha uma conexão real era o grupo do Lênin, é, que era a Liga de São Petersburgo, que era por lutar pela emancipação da classe trabalhadora. Lênin e Maktovs, que estava relacionado a algumas greves que aconteceram. E, e eles tiveram, em 1916, envolvidos numa greve que durou um dia inteiro, uh, 10 horas e meia. É, eles estavam trabalhando 13, 14 horas por dia e lutava por uma jornada de trabalho de 10 horas e meia por dia. E essa foi a primeira vez que os marxistas começaram a ter co conexões. E depois, é claro, o Partido dos Trabalhadores Social Democrático Russo foi fundado em Minsk, em 1898. Desde o começo houve um racha nesse partido daqueles que defendiam e eu estava se preocupados apenas com questões econômicas e pessoas como o Lenin que estavam é, preocupados e levantavam questões políticas. Mas eu quero enfatizar novamente que antes de 1905 nós ainda estamos falando de um movimento minoritário dentro da classe trabalhadora. E depois de 1905 a influência do sindicalismo era bem mais forte da polícia do que dos socialistas. Como é que isso aconteceu? Ah, o medo de, da disseminação da democracia social no começo do século novo, os funcionários do Tizá vieram com um esquema para tentar atacar os socialistas, desenvolvendo esse sindicalismo policial que, que assumiria mais o lado econômico e questões de seguro para o trabalhador, e tentar afastar os trabalhadores do socialismo e também criaria uma lealdade ao tizarismo, ao tizar. E, aliás, em 1903, 
foi nomeado ao nome de Zubotov. O movimento Zubotov liderou a primeira greve geral na Rússia em 1903, infelizmente, para Zubotov. E os funcionários do Tsar não estavam gostando do que ele estava fazendo, organizando uma greve geral, então ele foi demitido da fábrica. Mas esse sindicalismo policial tinha um, uma ligação forte com a classe trabalhadora e era muito mais dominante nas fábricas do que os socialistas. E se nós formos passar para frente para 1905, o... A Assembleia de Trabalhadores de Fábrica do Padre Gapon foi modelada com base nos sindicatos influenciados pelo Zubatov. Ele mesmo, Gapon, era um agente policial infiltrado e essa Assembleia de Trabalhadores tinha muito mais influência do que os socialistas. Muitas vezes os bolcheviques tentavam frequentar essas reuniões, mas eles eram expulsos dessas reuniões porque os trabalhadores não tinham interesse nas ideias socialistas. Bem, a refutação... De, a demissão de dois metalúrgicos para atividade sindical na maior fábrica metalúrgica em São Petersburgo, a Putilov, que é perto de Petrogrado, tinha 30 mil trabalhadores nessa fábrica. Dois trabalhadores foram demitidos por atividades sindicais. Isso se tornou um ímpeto para que o padre Gapon disse nós temos que fazer alguma coisa sobre isso, nós não podemos permitir que isso aconteça. E então, no dia 9 de janeiro de 1905, a Assembleia de Trabalhadores de Gapão liderou uma passeata de 50 mil trabalhadores para o Palácio de Inverno para submeter uma petição ao Tizar Nicolas II, que a gente pode ler a seguinte. Nós queremos nos dirigir humildemente e lealmente à sua majestade, os trabalhadores de São Petersburgo, no domingo, às duas horas da tarde, no Palácio de Inverno. Nós, trabalhadores e moradores de São Petersburgo, de várias partes, nossas mulheres, nossas casas, crianças, filhos e pais, vemos a sua majestade para buscar justiça e proteção. Nós somos empobrecidos, nós estamos sendo oprimidos, nós estamos com excesso de carga, com trabalho e somos maltratados. Portanto, esse apelo ao Tizar, pedindo ao Tizar para resolver os seus problemas, mas seus problemas, na verdade, eram radicais. Eles, eles pediam, por exemplo por uma Assembleia Constituinte, eles se reivindicavam eles reivindicavam por liberdades civis, o direito de, de organizar os sindicatos, um dia de jornada de trabalho de oito horas. E qual foi a resposta do Tizar do governo? Se vocês sabem um pouco sobre a história russa, esse é um dos pontos importantes de virada para o desenvolvimento da classe trabalhadora. As tropas russas ordenadas pelo Tizar atirou nessa passeata pacífica de 50 mil trabalhadores e matou 139 pessoas, foram mortas. A resposta dos trabalhadores foi imediata. Assassinos, sugadores de sangue, carrascos, vocês fogem dos japoneses, mas atiram contra seu próprio povo. Esse novo ódio ao Tizar foi impressionante da noite para o dia. E isso é algo que... Isso volta a, nós estamos voltando a, a 100 anos na história ou mais de mandar petições humildes aos governantes. Se você ver a petição feita antes de janeiro, você pode ver uma diferença muito grande. As petições anteriores ao Tizar eram muito humildes, eram apelos, eram súplicas ao Tizar. E depois de, que aconteceu da Revolução de 1905. Toda aquela coisa, ó, oh, sua majestade, tudo isso desaparece nas reivindicações e começa a listar as reivindicações, as reivindicações dos metalúrgicos e Ketarina Slav para a Assembleia do Parlamentar. Era a introdução da proteção legal ao trabalho, introdução imediata do dia de jornal de trabalho de oito horas, com o um salário correspondente a abolir, abolir o, o trabalho... E, excedente, é, estabelecer mediação com os trabalhadores, anistia a todos os, políticos, a todos os presos políticos, abolição do capital, liberdade de consciência, etc. Então, do ponto de vista dos trabalhadores, o dia 9 de janeiro é o dia que realmente a noção de ataque, de a, 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 a elogiar ou utilizar acabou aí, em termos do desenvolvimento da consciência da classe trabalhadora, termina nesse dia. A segunda lição muito importante da Revolução de 1905, e, o, e foi a noção da greve geral como arma política. A Rosa Luxemburgo escreveu sobre isso, mas especificamente sobre a greve geral como arma política, o ponto importante sobre essa ideia é que nós temos que lembrar 
que em muitos partidos sociais democratas da Europa naquela época, na verdade, eles tinham medo de usar a greve geral como arma política. A Rosa Luxemburgo baseou-se, generalizou as uh, suas ideias a partir de as ideias na Polônia, do que aconteceu na Polônia e na greve geral de São Petersburgo. Ela diz que isso é uma arma política muito importante na, nas mãos da classe trabalhadora, a greve geral. Portanto, a greve política era um avanço muito importante. E o outro avanço muito importante dos trabalhadores de 1905 foi o soviete dos trabalhadores que teve vida curta em São Petersburgo. Pela primeira vez saiu da greve geral. Em vez de ter apenas um comitê de greve, acabou elegendo uma espécie de um proto-governo ou com funções para governamentais. Então se tornou muito mais de um comitê de greve, mas assumiu a forma de um, um embrião de um governo revolucionário, apesar de que ter durado apenas um período curto de tempo, poucas semanas. Essa lição de 1905, ficou no movimento soviético uh, em 1905. Mesmo com a derrota da Revolução de 1905, foi uma lição muito importante para os trabalhadores russos. A terceira grande mudança, então, Lenin disse isso sobre os soviéticos. Em várias cidades, os soviéticos se tornou cada vez o uh, mais importante no papel que eles desempenham de criar um governo provisório revolucionário. Essa é a lição importante. Isso não é algo que apareceu e desapareceu. Não, essa é a foi muito importante em 1905. E a principal outra mudança de saída da Revolução de 1905 é que tanto o sindicalismo policial entre asma e o liberalismo entre os trabalhadores, que foi dominante até esse período, durante um tempo de 1905, da Revolução de 1905, não foi apenas um movimento de Zubotov, mas os liberais também tinham influência sobre o sindicato dos trabalhadores para minar a confiança deles, mas depois eles ficaram do lado dos reacionários. Os liberais também desaparecem do local de trabalho. Então, depois de 1905, a política que dominou o local de trabalho são aqueles que vêm dos socialistas, os principais sendo os bolcheviques, depois os mencheviques e os ESRs. Nós também temos que revolucionar os revolucionários socialistas que foram, desempenharam um papel importante no local de trabalho. Portanto, o ponto mais baixo do ativismo sindical de trabalho vem nos anos de repressão depois de 1905, de 1906 até 1908, onde mais de 3 mil políticos, prisioneiros políticos foram executados e outros 57 mil presos políticos foram exilados ou colocados em prisões. Eu estudei o local de trabalho e eu estudei em Moscou. Depois nós tivemos 4, 5 mil militantes no local de trabalho em 1905 e baixando para poucas centenas. O tamanho dessa sala, esse era o total de membros da organização bolchevique depois dessas prisões. Em 1910, nós apenas temos 222 greves envolvendo 37 mil trabalhos. Então, esse é o período de baixa do movimento dos trabalhadores por causa da repressão da Revolução de 1905. E isso fez com que os trabalhadores ficassem mais passivos e não lutassem. A faísca para a nova virada do movimento foi o massacre no Rio Lena das Minas de Ouro. Nós podemos ver que os pontos baixos do movimento foi, se deveu à repressão ou à guerra, mas o ponto de virada em que os trabalhadores foram atacados diretamente, todo mundo no país sabe que eles foram atacados, eles disseram, não, chega, nós não vamos aguentar mais esses ataques, nós vamos reagir como aconteceu em em janeiro de 1905 e com o massacre que aconteceu em abril de 1912. Portanto, os, os mineiros ah, trabalhavam 12 horas por dia em condições perigosas nas minas de ouro. No dia 4 de abril de 1912, 2.500 trabalhadores marcharam em protesto. As tropas governamentais abriram fogo contra esses grevistas e mataram 270 mineiros. E o que ainda ficou pior para o governo é que o ministro de Assuntos Internos, do interior, Makarov, disse o seguinte, assim foi e assim será no futuro. Ou seja, ele está dizendo que se vocês entrarem em greve, é isso que vai acontecer com vocês, vocês vão ser mortos a tiro. E a resposta do movimento dos trabalhadores foi impressionante. Ou seja, nas próximas três semanas, mais trabalhadores entraram em greve. E em São Petersburgo, por si só, entraram em greve mais nesse período que nos últimos quatro anos em todo o país. Então, um ponto importante de virada do movimento foi essa reação ao massacre da mina de ouro de Lena em 1912. Portanto... 
De 1912 até 1917, nós podemos ver isso como duas ondas, duas grandes ondas, com uma greve de seis meses no começo da guerra, mas é aquele movimento grevista de 1912 até 1917 mudou o desenvolvimento da classe trabalhadora e estabeleceu os parâmetros para o ano revolucionário. 9 mil greves envolvendo 4,5 milhões de trabalhadores e mais de 12 milhões de dias de trabalho perdidos e 32 rodadas de greves políticas. O centro era São Petersburgo, mas aconteceu em Moscou e em muitos centros industriais essas greves. Mas 32 rodadas de greves políticas, isso, na verdade, para mim, é uma coisa impressionante. Alguém é preso numa determinada fábrica em São Petersburgo, os trabalhadores de outras fábricas dizem, bem, você não pode prender essa pessoa. Ou trabalhadores é, de, um, na área de marinha organizam uma revolta, um mutim, e aí trabalhadores de, fa, de fábricas de Moscou, e você não pode prender marinheiros por isso, por mutim contra vocês. Então, essa onda de greves políticas de 1912 a, a, até a Revolução de Fevereiro, eu acho que é é um, é um período de um movimento que é pouco estudado nessa era revolucionária, que tempo, certa, tempo dia após dia, que os trabalhadores entram em greve, são os socialistas, principalmente no começo da Primeira Guerra Mundial. Tanto os mencheviques e os revolucionários socialistas ficam numa posição defensiva com relação à Primeira Guerra Mundial. Eles apoiam, de uma certa maneira, a, guerra, a Primeira Guerra Mundial. Depois, quando começa a, guerra, a Primeira Guerra Mundial, são os bolcheviques, pagam um preço muito alto, mas eles ficam contra a, a guerra. E toda vez que há uma greve, os trabalhadores saem de certas fábricas e nos próximos dias ah, um, eles pagam por isso sendo enviados para a Sibéria. Então, examinando esse movimento, o que eu tentei fazer no meu livro, no capítulo sobre o movimento pré-revolucionário, é tentar ver o movimento grevista vindo de baixo de uma fábrica, como é que funcionava isso. E o que eu descobri que esse movimento que vinha de baixo é que os choques que haviam organizado, às vezes nós temos um ou dois organizadores dessas greves que iam entrar em greve porque tinha trabalhadores que estavam comprometidos com a causa e tinham, levava a causa deles. Os trabalhadores de São Petersburgo estão entrando em greve porque eles aprenderam alguns dos deputados da Duma, da Assembleia, do, do Parlamento e nós temos que reagir. E se você vê uma oficina que entrou em greve com outra oficina de trabalho que não entrou em greve, que dependia da militância de apenas um ou dois militantes que lideravam esse movimento. Um outro ponto que eu queria falar sobre esse movimento grevista dessa época, eu estou falando sobre as greves políticas. Mas não é que, é que havia uma parede entre a, a greve econômica ou política. Não, na maior parte das greves políticas, ela encorajava os trabalhadores para exigir demandas econômicas e vice-versa. E também pelo fato de que muitos dos militantes que estavam estavam organizando essas greves eram os mesmos. Eu estou apresentando isso de uma maneira mais simplista aqui, porque eu estou falando sobre greves políticas e greves econômicas, mas, não, obviamente, não, eles estavam interrelacionados a esses dois movimentos grevistas. Em julho de 1913, uma fábrica de metalúrgica de Moscou, e cujo proprietário era um francês chamado Guzon, estava preocupado com outros donos de fábricas que o movimento de grevista acontecendo nas organizações industriais em Moscou não mostra uma forma econômica clara e na essência das reivindicações e outras eh, preocupações são reminiscentes de 1905. Então, os donos das fábricas, os patrões reconheciam o que, que estava acontecendo e tinham medo do que estava acontecendo nos patrões. E os patrões também fizeram uma comparação com outra fábrica que eu estudei, com outra, outra fábrica que tinha uma influência bolchevique maior que era uma fábrica na área metalúrgica, com uma forte presença bolchevique, a fábrica Bromley, em que os, os trabalhadores agiam, reagiam à agitação no chão de fábrica, e Bromley tinha 900 trabalhadores nessa fábrica. É, e, então, é, 1.100 trabalhadores e 900 foram entrar em greve para comemorar o aniversário do massacre de Lena. Então, eles não continuaram a trabalhar. No, em maio de 1913, 800 trabalhadores de Bromley pararam o trabalho, mas é, outras fábricas, como Guzon, não pararam. E, novamente, o mesmo tipo de padrão aparece, porque não havia nenhuma célula dentro dos metal, da fábrica de Moscou, mas havia em Bromley, é, haviam trabalhadores que diziam que nós temos que seguir aí e apoiar os trabalhadores das outras fábricas. E nós temos que continuar, entrar em greve.
Então, uma próxima baixa no movimento é o começo da guerra, onde há uma parada do movimento da classe trabalhadora. O sentimento nacionalista também acaba levando a um incidente muito ruim, que são as revoltas em maio de 1915 na Alemanha, contra os alemães. E eu documentei essas revoltas nacionalistas contra os alemães na Rússia. E eu documentei isso no meu livro e que nós temos que ser bem francos, que milhares de trabalhadores de Moscou foram convencidos pelos sentimentos nacionalistas no começo da Primeira Guerra Mundial e se manifestaram contra a Alemanha. Aliás, toda uma fábrica acabou atacando as empresas e fábricas alemãs. Mas depois que aconteceu é que esse sentimento nacionalista por, nos trabalhadores, depois da derrota, se torna claro que quem vai pagar a conta da guerra é a classe trabalhadora que vai pagar a conta da guerra. Depois de um ano, dez meses depois do começo da guerra, esse sentimento nacionalista entre a classe trabalhadora, começa a enfraquecer e os bolcheviques então começam a ter novamente uma ofensiva, começam a crescer com a queda de 1915. O primeiro incidente é que quando o Tsar proíbe que a Duma se reunir, ele diz que nós não vamos ter mais Duma, então houve uma de, um protesto de massa, um protesto político e greves políticas muito grandes contra essa proibição do Tsar. Bem, uma outra coisa que eu achei interessante sobre a guerra é que o alistamento de um homens para a guerra, para o serviço militar, houve uma mudança demográfica muito grande nas mulheres entrando na classe trabalhadora, até mesmo em fábricas que eram só homens, que quando chegamos a mudança na composição de gênero na classe trabalhadora era 27% as mulheres, mas quando chegamos em 1917, as mulheres constituíam uma fatia de 43% da classe trabalhadora industrial. Por causa da guerra e alistamento de homens para a guerra, você tem tantas mulheres e jovens trabalhadores entrando na força de trabalho em números muito maiores para forjar a unidade entre os trabalhadores no local de trabalho. Isso significava que os homens, que anteriormente ignoravam as demandas e preocupações das mulheres, mesmo depois de uma, que a sua força numérica começaram a crescer e as mulheres reivindicavam isso, começaram a levar a sério as reivindicações das mulheres. Então essa também foi uma mudança muito grande na composição dos metalúrgicos de Moscou. Em maio de 1916, quando toda essa fábrica foi, entrou em greve, as reivindicações dos trabalhadores incluíam o salário mínimo para tanto homem e para os, estag... os aprendizes e também pediam melhor organização para lutar contra a vitimização. Os trabalhadores começaram a aprender que se eles fossem entrar em greve ia ter pessoas demitidas, então uma das coisas que eles começaram a fazer foi organizar comitês de greve e uma das reivindicações de voltar para o trabalho era, eu vou voltar para trabalhar se essas condições forem atendidas e que também não deveria haver represália contra nenhum dos nossos camaradas. Se nós vamos ter reunião e acordo negociado, nós não podemos transformar nossos líderes em vítimas. Então, a classe trabalhadora, durante esse período muito difícil, durante a Primeira Guerra Mundial, está aprendendo a, a lutar. Bem, um último comentário sobre o período pré-revolucionário do movimento dos trabalhadores, pré-revolução de 1917, que vale a pena mencionar, é, são as atividades legais dos sindicatos e também eles estavam envolvidos com seguro social, com previdência social e, ele, e campanha de, para eleição para o parlamento. O problema da greve antes de 1917 é que eles não podiam entrar em greve, a greve era proibida. Portanto, os sindicatos metalúrgicos, como um sindicato, não tinha é, essa permissão, mas ele podia servir como uma arena para os trabalhadores se reunir e falar e, portanto, nesse sentido, o sindicato, apesar de não ter esse poder de contratual, era, tinha essa importância. Bem, o ritmo da radicalização durante o ano de 1917 foi bem mais rápido do que nós podíamos ver de 1904 até 1917. Os trabalhadores estão aprendendo, através da luta, que eles têm que se organizar melhor, especialmente os bolcheviques que passam a desempenhar um papel muito mais importante, organizando comitê de greve, como é que é, combater os sindicatos dominados por polícia. Então, esse ritmo, aprendendo através da luta, eu acho que isso é da ordem de magnitude muito mais rápida. Numa situação revolucionária, os tipos de coisas que os trabalhadores aprendem e o que eles fazem, na verdade, foi impressionante. 
Então, como é que a Revolução de 1917 começa? Como é que a Revolução de 1917 começa? Bem, as começas começam, as greves começam no Dia Internacional da Mulher em 1917, no dia 8 de março, que é o Dia Internacional da Mulher. Então, era 23 de fevereiro na Rússia, porque tem sete dias de atraso no calendário russo. Por que começaram com as mulheres? Porque as mulheres trabalhavam 13 horas por dia nas fábricas têxteis. E eles tinham que também, muitas dessas mulheres tinham que cuidar dos seus, dos seus filhos, porque seus maridos é, estavam no front, na frente da guerra. E combinando esses problemas, e eles agora tinham que esperar três, quatro horas em filas. Então, trabalhando de seis dias da semana, 13 horas por dia, e você ainda tem que ficar numa fila enorme, aí você pode conseguir um pedacinho de pão no final do dia. E depois levantar de um dia seguinte e fazer tudo de novo. De fato, a organização bolchevique, em São Petersburgo, o dia antes, nas vésperas do Dia Internacional da Mulher, fizeram um apelo às mulheres para não entrarem em greve. Nós não estamos prontas para uma greve, mas nós precisamos pegar o dia de 1 de maio para preparar uma greve geral para ofensiva. A versão rápida que as mulheres disseram, não, você pode ter todos os seus planos, tudo o que vocês quiserem, nós não vamos aguentar mais isso. Então, cinco fábricas testes de mulheres exclusivamente, nós vamos entrar em greve. As mulheres que decidiram, não os bolcheviques. E essas mulheres foram para as fábricas dos metalúrgicos e começaram a, então a jogar bola de neve nas fábricas. Vamos, pessoal, vocês saem em nosso apoio. E esse que foi o começo, que as mulheres chamaram os homens e que foi o começo da Revolução Russa. E eu devo dizer que isso é visto apenas como uma revolta por pão? Não. As mulheres também estavam ah, argumentando contra a guerra e por pão, mas eles principalmente fizeram contra o Tsar. Também as mulheres, desde o começo, era um movimento político do que um movimento por pão. Então, o resultado da Revolução de Fevereiro foi um sistema de poder dual. Eu não sei se eu já usei esse termo antes, mas basicamente, da noite para o dia, eu mencionei que o Conselho dos Trabalhadores o Soviético foi importante em 1905. O Soviético, que acabou aparecendo em 1917, o mais importante era deslocalizado em São Petersburgo, surgiu novamente, mas os líderes desses Soviéticos de trabalhadores... Os socialistas mais moderados disseram que nós não podíamos ter um governo socialista, que de fato, mas isso é uma revolução democrática burguesa, portanto, nós temos que forçar a burguesia liberal a assumir o poder, mesmo que eles não queiram ou não. Então, entregando a, o poder ao governo provisório em fevereiro de 1917, de acordo com os soviéticos, tinham seus próprios jornais e tinham várias comunidades organizando por comida, milícia. Era um mini governo em si, em si mesmo, os soviéticos, mas foi assim que eles conceberam a situação. Eles pressionariam o novo governo no interesse da democracia, mas não amedrontando eles o suficiente para uma contra-revolução. E essa se tornou a pauta para os socialistas moderados em fevereiro de 1917, vendo que o Conselho dos Trabalhadores como uma instituição de pressão do que uma instituição que poderia assumir o poder. Essa que é o racha entre os bolcheviques e os mencheviques, os bolcheviques à esquerda e os mencheviques à direita nesse racha, vendo os soviéticos como uma entidade democrática daquelas instituições por baixo, que a Raquel falou, como os, os bolcheviques e Lenin, em particular, era visto como uma instituição que deveria governar e não deveria conceder. E é isso que vai dominar durante meses, durante 1917. Então, Lenin reconheceu que esse sistema dual de poder que emergiu era inerentemente instável, porque o governo da burguesia de um lado e os sovietes e as suas instituições do esquerdo representavam, na verdade, um interesse de classe contraditório que não poderia ter uma conciliação por negociação. As novas liberdades democráticas é, é, na Revolução de Fevereiro levou a discussões políticas muito vivas e que aconteceu em cada fábrica na Rússia. 
Nós não temos que especular. Uma da coisa boa da Revolução Russa é que nós não temos que especular o que, que foi discutido, porque os soviéticos, os soviéticos simplesmente, muitos trabalhadores no começo da Revolução não faziam uma diferença entre os partidos socialistas diferentes. Mas, de alguma vez, eles tinham uma simpatia do, uh, pelos SRs e os mencheviques. E você pode analisar o número de deputados com de, dos diferentes partidos e o fado que eles eram chamados... Isso não é um sistema americano que você pode prometer qualquer coisa e depois você faz o que você quiser quando você é eleito durante quatro anos. Não. Eu tinha um recall de políticos. Isso quer dizer que os, os trabalhadores, numa certa fábrica, se eles não gostavam como o seu deputado estava se comportando, eles podiam é, convocar o deputado e tirar ele do cargo. Então, a proposta do soviético, você podia rastrear a radicalização da classe trabalhadora e dos soldados. Então, o soviético de Petrogrado é, tinha muitos representantes dos soldados também nos sovietes. Então, como é que os bolcheviques acabaram assumindo o poder uh, dos soviéticos. Como é que essa mudança aconteceu? De abril em diante, os bolcheviques uh, eles agiram como uma minoria na base do princípio. Eles reconheciam que eles eram uma minoria da classe trabalhadora do lado deles. Mas ele também, Lenin, era muito bom em assumir uma posição de agir na base do princípio. Muito bem, é muito ok para a minoria, mas nós somos contra o que nós estamos querendo fazer na guerra. Tudo bem que vocês não resolveram a questão da terra, mas nós vamos resolver a questão da terra e nós vamos terminar com a guerra. Nós queremos controlar as fábricas, nós queremos terminar com a guerra, nós queremos terminar com a guerra capitalista. Tudo isso foi combinado com uma crise econômica cada vez maior para terminar com a guerra. A guerra foi um dos fatores-chave que surgia de tempo em tempo, a primeira vez... No primeiro mês, eu chamaria, foi um período de uh, lua de mel da Revolução de Fevereiro. Os trabalhadores não podiam rever as diferenças entre os diferentes partidos socialistas, queriam ter paz, mas não necessariamente sabiam fazer uma diferença entre os bolcheviques e outras organizações de esquerda. Os bolcheviques, eles mesmos, em março de 1917... É, não dizer que deviam tomar o poder. E o Lenin é muito bom nisso, de liderar os bolcheviques e assumirem uma posição mais radical. A primeira crise é, de abril, de, 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 o chefe do governo provisório, depois de ser pressionado em concordar em que nós vamos é, buscar as é, metas imperialistas, ele começa a falar com a imprensa e dizer, bem, vamos, vamos tomar a Turquia. E isso, se, isso não é qualquer um, esse é o ministro de relações exteriores e se torna um escândalo muito grande quando ele fala que eles vão tomar a Turquia. E a principal protesto contra o, o governo soviético e os bolcheviques tiveram é, uma importância muito grande foi nos dias de abril. E foi irônico que os bolcheviques estão carregando cartazes que dizem abaixo Milikov e outros que, que carregavam cartazes abaixo Lenin. Então, pela primeira vez nas ruas de Petrogrado, nós temos um choque entre classes, ou seja, classe trabalhadora e os soldadores, entrando em confronto físico com os homens donos da propriedade. E isso levou à questão da guerra, que a questão da guerra toda hora aparecia. Em junho, os socialistas moderados desistiram da posição defensiva e argumentaram que eles acabaram apoiando o Kerensky e a ofensiva de Kerensky em junho. E eu não quero entrar em todos os detalhes, mas essencialmente foi um desastre. O exército russo não estava numa posição de combater uma guerra, entrar numa guerra. E isso acabou enfraquecendo a posição dos socialistas moderados dentro do soviete. Nos dias de julho, eu acho que provavelmente é melhor chamar que julho, foi mais do que um uma, 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 uma protesto armado de 40 mil pessoas. Em junho, no final de junho, os bolcheviques tinham uma maioria dos trabalhadores dos soviéticos de Petrogrado. Também havia a parte dos soldados que não era tão radical. E durante em julho, quando, na verdade, ele usou esse termo com medo, é um cenário de comuna de Paris aparecendo, que mesmo se eles pudessem tomar o poder, ele tinha medo que 
um Petrogrado radicalizado seria isolado, como aconteceu na Comuna de Paris. Então, há um discurso famoso de Lenin, no final de junho, em que ele diz uh, um discurso que ele fala, camarada, se nós tomarmos o poder... Em Petrogrado, apenas nós vamos ficar isolados e nós vamos ser massacrados. Portanto, os dias de julho, na verdade, foram começados. É uma semi-insurreição, porque eles, é muito mais que um protesto, porque eles prendem muita gente, eles tentam prender Kerensky, mas não encontraram Kerensky. Eles entraram no Soviético e tentaram prender o Teresteri, que era o líder Menchevik, trabalhadores da fábrica de Petira. Portanto, nós vamos encontrar esse cara que está defendendo a guerra. Vamos ver o que ele vai dizer quando a gente pegar ele. Mas eles não encontraram ele. Mas eles conseguiram prender Chernov, que era o líder dos SRs. Ele apenas foi liberado. Alguns de, alguns de vocês já leram sobre isso, foi libertado, porque Trotsky disse basicamente, salvou a vida dele. Ele ia ser arrastado pelos marinheiros e o que, que, os, que, que os marinheiros podiam fazer com ele? Então a versão mais rápida que eu posso dizer é que Lenin argumentou que nós não podemos tomar o poder em Petrogado somente, nós temos que esperar. E nós temos que ganhar os trabalhadores em outras cidades para que a gente pode tomar o poder como uma classe e não como um grupo isolado, não como um movimento minoritário em Petrogado. Portanto, existem muitos detalhes que eu queria falar em termos do movimento dos trabalhadores nas fábricas, mas eu vou tentar resumir. Basicamente, a questão se tornou uma de controle dos trabalhadores. O que nós queremos dizer com controle dos trabalhadores? Não significou na Revolução Russa que os trabalhadores é que dirigem as fábricas. O que esse controle dos trabalhadores significou é que os trabalhadores assumem controle de alguns aspectos das fábricas que normalmente você pensaria sendo como responsabilidade dos trabalhadores. Por exemplo, a fábrica de metalúrgico de Moscou, a Metalworks, os trabalhadores decidiram que eles iam demitir a gerência. Eles disseram, vocês estão demitidos, vocês não trabalham mais aqui. E as mulheres eh, seriam assediadas pelos seus gerentes, dizendo que vocês estavam demitidas. E, e a gerência, é claro, ficou revoltada. Vocês não podem nos demitir. Nós podemos negociar salários, mas nós não podemos demitir trabalhadores. Trabalhe, eh, demitir empregados que trabalham para mim. O que vocês estão querendo fazer aqui? Portanto, esse movimento de controle dos trabalhadores, eh, que comitês de fábricas que apareceram em muitas fábricas, começaram a assumir controle sobre a própria fábrica. Não que eles dirigiam a fábrica, mas eles analisavam as finanças das fábricas. Eu até mesmo estudei o João, que, um, que era o proprietário dessa fábrica, e os, os trabalhadores investigaram as finanças e disseram, você está tendo lucro, você, você dá dinheiro para o governo provisório, eu quero fechar a fábrica, eles estão demitindo os gerentes, eles estão em greve toda hora, o Guzon queria fechar a fábrica dele. E os trabalhadores disseram, não, você está tendo lucro, e eles mostraram para ele uh, os livros de contabilidade do Guzon para o governo provisório, e o governo provisório ficou do lado dos trabalhadores, não porque eles tinham simpatia pelo momento dos trabalhadores, mas que tudo na fábrica que foi produzido, foi produzido para a guerra. Portanto, a fábrica foi nacionalizada Alguns outros pontos que eu queria mencionar sobre o movimento dos trabalhadores nas fábricas, repetidamente foram feitas ameaças, mas essas ameaças nunca foram realizadas. Ou seja, o sentido de poder dentro da classe trabalhadora era tal que... Mais três minutos. O sentido de poder dentro da fábrica era tal que se a gerência fizesse concessões aos trabalhadores, os trabalhadores disseram, ah, fizeram concessões, agora a gente pode pedir por mais. Se a gerência dissesse, não, nós não vamos te dar nada intransigente, eles entravam com, com raiva. Então o movimento dos trabalhadores na fábrica de Gujon se tornou parecido com outras fábricas. A resposta da gerência das fábricas, da direção da empresa em Petrogado e Moscou foi de fechar as fábricas. Então é quase uma reversão. Nós achamos que é um movimento militante da classe trabalhadora. Na verdade, foram os empregadores que fizeram uma espécie de greve fechando as fábricas. Então, em agosto, o movimento fica mais político. Não há nenhuma solução por uma única fábrica. E um último ponto que eu quero ressaltar, mencionar, é o Affair Kornilov. 
O golpe militar do general Kornilov, ele foi muito franco. O Kornilov disse, bem, o que nós temos que fazer com esse soviético de Petrogrado, nós temos que enforcar cada um deles. Ele falou isso explicitamente, Lenin era o primeiro da lista dele para ser enforcado. Nós temos que começar com Lenin, enforcar Lenin, depois nós temos que ir para o soviético de Petrogrado e enforcar todo mundo. Então, até em agosto... A visão de classe se torna muito claro. Não há nenhuma conciliação possível. A influência dos Menschenvix e dos ERS começa a cair, a declinar. Porque como é que você pode fazer uma, com concessões? A primeira coisa que uma pessoa diz é que nós vamos matar Lenin e ir atrás dos Menschenvix, perseguir uh, os sindicalistas também. Então, a resposta depois do golpe de Kornilov, e Kornilov tinha esses grandes planos de ter uma ditadura militar o general Kornilov foi apoiado e, uh, e na, é que ele foi apoiado por todo mundo fora do campo socialista, incluindo os liberais os liberais já não aguentavam mais quando chegou em agosto e eles foram derrotados por causa da organização da classe trabalhadora e em Petrogrado 40 mil trabalhadores estavam armados e prontos para lutar mesma coisa em Moscou e mesma coisa em outros lugares então o que isto significava que a lição aprendida o tema da minha palestra são as lições aprendidas naquela momento os trabalhadores reconheceram que não havia nenhuma solução de compromisso com essas pessoas. Os dias de concessões com os patrões e os líderes militantes, esses dias acabaram. Nós temos que tomar o poder. Depois de agosto de 1917, a influência do bolchevismo se torna cada vez mais forte à medida que os trabalhadores começam a reconhecer que não há um terreno para conciliação. E eu apenas quero lembrar das pessoas que nós vamos ver nos últimos nos próximos meses, nós vamos ver muita propaganda. Eu sei que é, Robert Service escreveu um livro sobre Trotsky e diz que como Trotsky foi uma pessoa terrível, nós vamos ver muita propaganda anticomunista e anti-revolução russa. Nós temos que nos preparar. A principal questão de 1917 é que ela vai ser retratada como um golpe de Estado. E nós temos que ver o Congresso de Sovietes e lembrar as pessoas que definem esse argumento que foi um golpe de Estado, que a maioria da classe trabalhadora naquela época... 505 deputados de 607, de um total de 607, votaram pelo poder, todo o poder aos soviéticos. Isso não foi um golpe de Estado. E depois de 18 anos de experiência dos trabalhadores, eles acabaram votando contra o capitalismo e pelo socialismo. Muito obrigado. Thank you, Kevin, for your presentation. We will now go on to our third speaker, Professor Valeri Arkady. Good evening. I'm very happy to be with you. So before going into my presentation, uh, it's quite unusual what we see here today. Uh, here at the Fluminense Federal University, we're having this seminar. And in the first week of October, we'll be at the Sao Paulo University. These are two academic events organized to celebrate the uh, 100 years of the Russian Revolution. These are two opportunities where our very small parallel universe comes together. So first of all, thank you to my friends who are here. I believe I am very close to almost half of you, but especially thanking Badaro and other colleagues from NIEPI for the opportunity to be here with Raquel and Kevin, and the presence of uh, Luis Leria, Coelho, Felipe, Regiani, Paula from Fortaleza, Fatima from Sao Paulo, my friend Greenspan, and Alex from London, my friend coming from the farthest away. So this is a petit comité. And therefore, I will allow myself to extrapolate a little bit, to be a little barbaric. 
The second element is that we are meeting here to celebrate, but upon celebrating, we also have to have a critical view. Marxism is always revolutionary, and as such, open, critical, live uh, Marxism for the 20th century needs to have a very brave uh, vision of its own self. So think about thinking about 1917 is also to make a critique about the revolution. And my third observation is that what we are having here today at the university will happen in other universities in the state of Sao Paulo, in the capital city of Sao Paulo, in the state of Pernambuco, in the north of Brazil in December. So we have a uh, Marxist left unionist uh, movement in the Brazilian universities which many times makes our international guests very jealous of our condition it is also very troublesome of course to be to have this position but none of these celebrations will happen in Moscow and Petrograd in Moscow and Petrograd universities we they will not organize a seminar like this one and we have to think about why? Why are we celebrating the Russian Revolution in Brazil and they will not celebrate it in Russia? And last of all, <coughs> to shorten my opening and to make it uh, 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 this horror image that Raquel brought to us, we learned some lessons from the Russian Revolution. So eventually if we win in Brazil and if we bring a revolution, the idea of distributing vodka for free is entirely eliminated from the program. No vodka, no cachaça, and no beer. It's unthought of. The results are never good, and it's not worthwhile. Now going straight into my topic. What is the topic that I will talk about? I was invited by the uh, PSOL uh, journal, uh, PSOL is a Brazilian political party, to talk about the Russian Revolution, and this is what I will do here today, the same presentation. The Russian Revolution has one historical originality that distinguishes it from the Chinese Revolution, the Vietnamese, the Cuban, even the Algerian Revolution, and any other uh, successful revolution in the 20th century. And it does not follow the pattern of the other successful revolutions. So in this regard, it is an, an exception in history. It is a uniqueness or peculiarity in history. It is a proletarian and urban revolution led by a party that has a capitalist program that was built as a, a conscious a project, an instrument for organization that was developed for two decades to become handy when they would finally have the revolutionary rupture. And during these tw two decades, uh, it had built the most powerful international uh, group of European Marxism. Its most experienced uh, uh, resources were from European Marxism. There were many revolutionary Marxists in Germany, Italy, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and, any, and many other other countries, but in no other country was there uh, developed a core, uh, organized political core with such influence in the workers' classes uh, that can be compared to Bolshevism. It is the first time in history that a revolution made by the majority for the majority won. Uh, so far, that was simply a hypothesis, and a hypothesis Hypothesis means that it was a project and uh, being under development uh, originated in the European workers' movement 
in a more complex and 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 full way by Marx, but it was only a hypothesis. There was no historical precedent that suggested it would ever be possible to have a revolution made by proletarians, peasants, workers, uh, to serve the majority of the people and that it could win. Uh, the greatest challenge, uh, historical and theoretical challenge we have when we try to explain the Russian Revolution is to explain how they won because after them many try to have the, all those uh, proletarian uh, movements uh, they simply failed. And there is something in the Russian experience that needs to be captured and understood. It's historical originality. But, well, of course, this is very controversial. I will not give you the bibliography of this controversy because that would take a whole semester. I will uh, focus on one particular debate that took place involving two of the best, greatest minds that reflected upon this problem around Marxism is the uh, is the uh, toxicity and I'm sorry. Well, both of them discussed this specific theme. Why did they win? And they found answers that are not only different but not compatible and not reconcilable. Sometimes you have different answers, but they can combine or communicate with each other. But no, these are totally incompatible. They cannot be right at the same time, both of them. So when we try to explain uh, the Russian Revolution and how original it is, there is one first discussion which is not between Deutsche and Trotsky, but which is the famous antagonism between the objective and subjective conditions. So there is one response which is outside of this um, debate between the two and which explains the victory of the Russian Revolution would be the drama, dra drama, the dramaticity of its elements. So for any materialistic analysis, the exceptional objective conditions is crucial. It is an assumption of rational thought that men make history, but not exactly like they want it. They change the world in the conditions that they inherited it from uh, the older generations. And the objective conditions, therefore, have already been announced by Raquel and Kevin. So I will simply classify them into four major objective factors. It's an oversimplification, a theoretical model. I will stick to four. Of course, I could do 10 and I am speaking very happily, uh, very rapidly. I hope I don't cause a heart attack in our uh, interpreters and they're not. <laughs> but the first element is drama and defeat in war. It's an exceptional objective factor. However, it is not true that there were not other wars as uh, even more dramatic, such as World War II, and in industrialized countries, they the war led to the defeat of the whole state and the army. Now, the drama of participating in the war, the defeat in war, and how obtuse czarism was with regards to war, that is, the state politics of the aristocracy, decadent uh, aristocracy that controlled Russia, trying to keep up a five million men army even after uh, losing so many lives in the first three years of war. Evidently, this factor brings up, uh, produces enormous social stress. Imagine the trains crossing the high plains of the Russian Empire 
carrying hundreds or millions of uh, uh, corpses to be uh, to return to their ro homes in the villages of Russia. Their sons, their children, and their sons, which are their greatest treasure for the peasants. That went on for one year, for two years, for three years, three million dead, and the army still maintains an army of five million. So the Tsar was willing to give away all, as many lives that was necessary up to the German Empire to keep the alliance with Paris and London and honor their commitment with their allies. The second element is how ar uh, the archaism of the regime itself. We're speaking of a state controlled by an aristocracy with proto-bourgeois elements, but it's not a bourgeois class. Russia enters the 20th century with two d ruling classes. It's not one single class. There is the aristocracy, the nobles, and there is the entrepreneurial class, they uh, have well, the business class. They have connections. Uh, there is uh, uh, the aristocracy comes closer to the bourgeois, but there was no historical merging as we had seen before in uh, England and others. So it's very archaic. This straight, it's like an, an old regime. Russia, the fifth most industrialized country in the world in 1917. It was the fifth industrialized country in the world, but 90% of the population were peasants, and the state has strong characteristics of uh, an archaic uh, structure and a decadent aristocracy. The third element is the frailness of uh, Russian bourgeoisie, their impotence facing the bourgeois revolution. Uh, we can only explain 1917 with a lot of abstraction if we use this element. Russia was facing a revolution. It was nothing to surprise the world. The second half of the 19th century, not only the socialists, but anyone who had any education in Europe knew that it was just a matter of time to have a revolution in Russia. That was in the horizon. It was surprising that it didn't even happen before, but it didn't happen before because the Russian bourgeoisie was impotent, incapable. They were decadent facing this historical task they had uh, received, which was to defeat or to bring down Tsarism. And instead of doing that, they simply joined Tsarism. And that was fatal for them. If bourgeoisie does not produce the democratic revolution, uh, uh, another society has to do it or else there will be social uh, breakdown. No human society will dive into uh, historical decadence that has no way out without resistance. Uh, the crisis needs to happen. And you might not even find a way out, like Syria or Iraq. Uh, societies disintegrate. Integrate. They go back centuries, millennia. Yes, this may happen. Maybe all social classes can fail. A mutual destruction of all classes that are fighting. But in Russia, the impotence of the bourgeoisie brought about something extraordinary in a relatively short uh, historical period. Two decades is very short historically. Of course, uh, for an adult generation, it is a lot of time. Especially at that time, their life expectancy was not be beyond 40 years. So 20 years was a lot. But the 20 years it took for Marxism to become the vocabulary uh, representing the most advanced uh, of the workers' movement, replacing after 1905 the embryonary movement that was infiltrated by agents from the Ukraine, the most powerful political police of the world in the beginning of the 20th century. Ukraine. Okrana, uh, that they were very powerful 
They were like the Brazilian m military dictators here. They were infiltrated in the factories. And that was a relatively short period for the workers' movement to take on Marxism as its vocabulary. But however, something happened that brings us back to these objective uh, dimension. What happened was that the semi-resurrectional movement that leads to the February movement and immediately the two popular parties, Mensheviks in the cities and, and in the rural areas, they went to the government and there is no historical precedent, precedent to what happened. We had a very uh, dim image of the uh, first government led by Prince Laval, the second by Kerensky, and the participation of, rem reminds us of Milhan in France during the Dreyfus uh, episode, but very far away. So the fourth uh, factor is that the workers and peasants movements joined the bourgeois to take power, and that they decided to go on with the war in the Russian state after a revolutionary process that they did not predict, that they did not organize this insurrection itself, places them in the position of power and upon taking over power they accept to maintain the Tsar's compromises with the allies in the Entente. This is the fourth uh, factor and it brought about an enormous crisis because the movement of the Russian Republic, of this uh, government that takes power and goes on with the war in Russia, promising a constitutional assembly, but only after uh, war was won, agrarian reform, but only after the war was won, new modern labor laws, but only after the war was won. This has an enormous objective importance. These are the objective factors. So. To using uh, an old word pusillanimity whenever I uh, give a presentation I like to use these very hard word of the Mensheviks, the organic frailty of the, the Russian, the archaic Tsarism, and the drama of the defeat in war. These are these objective factors, but they do not explain the Russian Revolution. So we have to look at the subjective factors. These subjective factors, among them, we have three subjective factors, basically. The point is, that in the interaction between them, they have a relative weight. For example, or, or that is, an analysis can be correct by in identifying the central factors, but the relative weight Engels mentions that uh, the parallelogram of forces, uh, when we analyze the topic of class subjectiveness, it's not a simple cause and effect relationship. So what are the key factors? The first is the willingness for fight of the proletarians and peasants. This is subjective and of course it fluctuates. What what does it mean that it is that it fluctuates even facing dramatic situations there may or may not be a willingness for a revolutionary fight or struggle among these social beings the revolution might not have had the energy after overthrowing the tsar to have all those successive waves putting pressure on the soviets and then putting pressure on lvov and then kerensky so that the government could finally leave war. The social subjects, they don't have inexhaustible energy. The, their energy is not being renewed. This pressure pot 
is very strong, but this strength, this energy can disperse. There are misunderstandings, there are there is treachery. All that conspires against maintaining morale when we're talking about an impulse uh, uh, involving millions of people. How can you maintain, keep up this morale? And this is what cre is creating awareness. The idea that awareness has a linear development is too childish. When we talk about class struggle, this it's a v uh, fluctuating process that depends on political struggle. And this is the second factor. The second factor is the quality of collective political <laughs> subjects. In the revolutions of pre-capitalist societies and the bourgeois revolutions, the bourgeoisie didn't build the modern political parties in the modern sense of the word. They had leaders as most of the class struggles in Latin America until very recently, uh, one generation ago, the experience of organizing the popular classes, they had these very strong centralizing leaders. Even the P Workers' Party in Brazil under Lula, this is all very archaic. The uh, collective political subject is building uh, instruments for struggle in which uh, hundreds of thousands of leaders cooperate with each other and accept an or a common organization in order to decide what to do. And this is the political party in contemporary society. So the quality of the Bolshevik party was one crucial subjective element. And um, what is the quality? of the political subject, the efficacy and efficiency of this instrument. The first element of quality is implementation. The political subject that does not find resonance, implementation, that does not build influences and hegemony, he ends up sterile. Bolshevism is able to implement itself uh, among the different levels from Odessa to Petrograd, from Kiev to the Ur Urals. It's present in the cities, in the universities, in the press, and in the big factories, in the transport, in the railway workers, the metal workers, the chemical industries, oil industry. So it's uh, actual implementation. And these uh, people, these resources that come up from these spontaneous struggles find some kind of support. When they are persecuted by Tsarism, there is the guard to protect them. And if they are arrested, when they leave prison, the party helps them with solidarity networks and support networks. They relate to the prisoners' families. They offer support and they keep up their morale. This means that if we want well, they're, they're not exactly small, but they're local. They're local leaders, men and women, prepared through this uh, fight struggle that transforms, each, uh, turns each and every one of them into conveyors of this collective experience. So the working class in Russia did not have to learn everything over again because the problem of a working class that does not build political instruments is that it loses count or memory of its own struggles and they have to keep starting all over again. Bolshevism. With Bolshevism, it was, not, it was not necessary to start over again. They had the lessons learned, the experience developed from 1896 that Kevin reminds us, 1905, the strikes after 1912, that was accumulated experience. The third element of subjectiveness is the direction taken by Bolshevism. Uh, the direction of Bolshevism is a different factor, different from Bolshevism 
activism itself. It is a factor which in a fine-tuned, uh, detailed analysis which must be done with Marxism with, uh, and also in, in a hierarchy. We need to put into a hierarchy this quality. And in the Bolshevism, we have the role of Lenin, evidently. The specificity that involves elements in an even more detailed analysis of the psychological relationships, uh, the relationships between the members uh, at the top of the party. And this topic has brought a controversy between Deutscher and Trotsky. So the controversy b is that Deutscher, in his biography of Trotsky, which is written, as you know, much, a, much a long time after uh, the Russian Revolution, he states that Trotsky's assessment of the victory of the Russian Re Revolution is, would not be deserved by a Marxist. That's very serious. In the history of the Russian Revolution, when Trotsky comes to the insurrection, he remembers the three points of Bolshevism, and he says that Bolshevism would never have survived united. That is, it would have been devastated by an uns insoluble uh, division if it were not for Lenin. They would not have solved the April issues. They would not have solved the crisis that was opened after the semi-resurrection of July that Kevin reminded us and the Kornilov attempted coup. And it would not simply have solved the most important crisis, the most serious, the fatal one, which was to uh, the decision to fight or not for power. So in the April thesis, when Lenin presents them, I don't know if you've read them. If you haven't, it's worthwhile. It's a two-page long text. Most of the Brazilian uh, newspaper columnists write more than that every single day. So it's a document that is almost lost in history, but you cannot miss it. It's one of the best texts of Marxism, and it uh, summarizes Marxism in only two pages. Mar Marxism has some Lacan trends, but they are not the best part of Marxism. When Lenin <laughs> comes in April. Most of the Bolsheviks want to uh, favor a, crit uh, a, s a crit critical support of the provisional government. But in the first plenary in Petrograd, Lenin presents the April thesis, and on the day after, uh, there is a meeting between the two parties to discuss their unification. They were going to join hands. And this was being prepared internally in the Bolshevik party. And this is very subversive. Lenin not only uh, positions himself against this unification, but he calls upon the party to organize a national conference so that the party can become an opposition party and bring agitation and unrest and to prepare the second revolution. It's a political intellectual uh, subversion. It's a reversal, uh, 180 gra degree turn, and this is done without any division. Trotsky says something needs to explain this. Why is the direction that defended a different line in only three weeks simply accepts Lenin's policy? They developed for 20 years the most revolutionary political instrument of history, and when it time comes to face the challenge of preparing for the revolutionary crisis, the government decides to support class collaboration, including a prince as a prime minister. It could be less shameful, right? In Brazil, it would be like having Renan Calheiros, the former uh, head of Senate, as the prime minister. I don't like Renan. But there are even worse politicians here, I know. But this family, his family is, well, we have issues with them. Let's just keep to that. It's a very big and powerful family. <coughs>
Now the second crisis is not small. Lenin defends in face of the July events. He says we will not fight for power. And what happens to the Bolshevik leaders when the factories begin to go down from Putilov, for example, down to Donetsk? The militants in the local uh, committees, the Bolsheviks, refuse to speak against uh, taking power, uh, taking over the palace, invading the Tarid palace, and surround the Soviet. So they decide to change the leader, to send the leaders of the Central Committee, and they don't want to speak at the door of the factories. They knew they would be booed and run over by the workers. And the third crisis is even biggest. The uh, Central Bolshevik meeting uh, took place every week. They have 21 members. They have uh, minutes of every meeting, and they were going to decide on the revolution and the preparation for the meeting is dramatic. Lenin had written uh, letters from the house where he was exiled in Finland since the, the repression to Bolshevism in, Ju in June. The party was uh, legalized, the palace was closed, the newspapers were shut down, and Lenin, I don't know if you're aware, he returns alone without any support of the party from Finland. His mother-in-law, Krupskaya's mother with the ridiculous wig, uh, gives him that ridiculous wig, he goes in in a boat and he makes a point of going into headquarters to make his demands because they were not answering his letters in which he said it's necessary to uh, set a date for the insurrection. They said you cannot come back, they do not publish his letters and they do not answer his letters. This is how the Central Committee meeting uh, took place to decide on the date. Lenin and Trotsky against everybody else. Of the 21, only 11 are present. Nine vote for insurrection and two against. So there was no quorum. Nine out of 21. Nobody put that into doubt. But can you understand Trotsky's argument? The meeting that to decide the insurrection did not have the majority present. So Tro the Trotsky has this conclusion in the Russian Revolution. He says, we have a problem, Houston. And if this happened with Bolshevism in the three most important moments, uh, then the leaders were wrong. What can we expect? of the future now. It's, it seems quite difficult to fight against capitalism and therefore Lenin uh, does what Deutscher states is a paradox, so a conclusion for Marxism, which is that the most revolutionary instrument of history when it had to face the challenge of history simply was not sufficient and it was necessary to have Lenin present to produce that last factor, the last drop of water, the last element that produced history. And Deutscher says that that is not Marxism. It is not compatible with Marxism. It's an interesting explanation, but not Marxist. And what does Trotsky say? Trotsky says that when uh, all other factors are considered at the height of a revolutionary crisis, when you're dealing with struggle for power, so it's not the struggle to bring revolution. The revolution is al are already ongoing. The insurrection is this further moment. It's a political military action that depends on a political military subject with a very strong will uh, and decision to take take power. At this point, the subjective elements, the subjective factors that are interacting with each other develop complex relationships and therefore the assessment has to go to a higher abstraction level and Trotsky reasons in the following way. In the relationship with the working class, 
The Bolshevik Party must be considered as a subjective element. It is an expression of the awareness of a vanguard that had been uh, dialoguing for two decades. It's a subjective element in this sense, but in the relationship between the party and its leaders, then it is an objective element. In the relationship with the leader of the Bolshevik, uh, the party is not subjective, it's subjective, but its, le its leaders are subjective. And in the, the leaders, among the leaders in the Central Committee, and with regards to Lenin, the Central Committee is the objective factor and Lenin is the subjective one because objective and subjective are always relative to each other. This is Trotsky's uh, explanation and that was the first argument. Now the second argument is that in history there are weeks or months that are, are, are like um, days uh, and days that are like eternity because this cannot repeat itself and in fighting for power the political crisis moment is when the enemy is w the weakest and you have to try to coincide the, coincide the enemy's weakest moment with your own strongest moment that's the moment when it is necessary to take the risk all or nothing. If you don't take the risk, you, you won't have the opportunity again, the window of opportunity, and you might not even have another window. So time is of the essence. That's the second argument. There is a window in history of three or four weeks where, where it was possible to have an insurrection, insurrection to defeat Kerensky. Why wouldn't this window appear two months later? Because he would uh, shift or take his uh, loyal uh, groups and army to the capital or he would take troops and call mercenaries. He would take uh, troops and ta send them to Petrograd and t send the mercenaries to the front. He knew that he had to focus on Petrograd and Mo Moscow and if there were time Kerensky would bring the troops, the Cossacks, the mercenaries, he would even abandon the front and compromise with the Germans and have a truce to avoid the revolution, to prevent the revolution from happening. And Trotsky says in the history of Russian Revolution, one of the reasons why we won is because we surprised Kerensky and we did that because there had only been one attempt of struggle which was the Paris Commune before that. And the next revolutions, this is one of the greatest moments when he says the next revolutions will be even more difficult with Russia because the counter-revolution learns faster than the revolution and the future Kerenskys will not let themselves be surprised as we surprised Kerensky. This is Trotsky's second argument. And Trotsky's third argument is the most surprising one of all. The third argument is Lenin's personality. Le uh, Trotsky says, if I were not in Petrograd, if I had been murdered in July and not uh, arrested, the revolution would have won because there was Lenin. If they had murdered Lenin, it would never have possible to keep the Bolshevik unity. They would never be willing to go on uh, fighting for power if only I were defending insurrection. Without Lenin in that meeting, we would never have overturned the vote. And that's the most terrible and disturbing uh, comment and argument. And I conclude by saying what impact the, has this had in the last 100 years? I think it was a great impact. I think about this for, s I've been thinking about this for some time, as you can imagine. I've been writing books and preparing the Brazilian revolution. I don't write books only. <coughs> It's not what takes up most of the time, let's put it this way.
And the topic is devastating because it refers to a reflection that's theoretical and philosophical about the national individual. And this topic, as you know, there is uh, tons of uh, pr production on that, but, and I'm not going into that, but ultimately this is what we're talking about. And what I mean to say is that this topic had a great impact in the revolutionary history because the um, revolutionary um, current and the political movement among workers that defended nationalism in a in the best way for is for those comes from those who consider themselves Lenin's heirs known as the Trotskyists as you know Trotsky was a last minute Bolshevik Trotsky joined the Bolsheviks in July He's a last-minute Bolshevik. And this original sin was very important in the intellectual revolution of uh, Trotsky's thought because after October, Trotsky joins a kind of super-Leninism. It's an intellectual phenomenon that is very common when you arrive late, when you come to the middle of adult life and you have a deep self-criticism about part of your journey and you uh, stick to ideas that were not yours, the, the, then this will lead to a superlative adhesion. And therefore Bolshevism in Trotsky has a Leninist uh, character and super-Leninism means that the organizations that came from the uh, in Fourth International embraced the powerful idea, this very strong idea that fight for fight the struggle for a revolution is the struggle for the Revolutionary Party. They joined that, they adhered to that so strongly and so passionately and the Stalinists didn't have this. That's why Trotskyists are uh, less in number in the world but they give us the impression of being so many. When the PT party was founded, the Trotskists were less than 3,000 militants. And there's a lot of bibliography to prove that. And more than half of them did not, or, or, or were, so, were still too young. They were not in the, only in the beginning of their adult life, very young not more than 3,000, and they seemed so much more powerful. So I will conclude by saying that when we think about the October Revolution, there are three political practical uh, conclusions, and in a debate with this academic di uh, dimension, we have academics here, but we also have militants, and you're all welcome. So my three conclusions. First of all, it is impossible to think about a uh, socialist revolution in the in the 21st century without a working class involved. So Marxism joins the working class or will die as an intellectual train of thought. Marxism with without the vitality, the robustness, the power of a social relationship with the working class is basically sterile. So the first major challenge is this. The fact that we are in universities, most of us are researchers, professors, we dedicate our lives to uh, give classes, to write in journals and write books. If we are serious Marxists, we should have a practical relation with the workers' movement. And the intellectuals' role in the working class is to help them learn, to give them the opportunity to learn for those who had never had a chance to get the same education we got. And this is what we do not do by uh, speaking inside the classroom. We have to go where the workers are. This is the first thing that I want to tell you. If we want to celebrate the Russian Revolution, 
we need to go there. The second thing I want to tell you is that if we want to celebrate the legacy of the Russian Revolution, we need to conclude that we need to build a political collective um, group. So all our centers are uh, wonderful. They bring us many joys. They bring us many rewards. We're very happy inside our intellectual bubble. As my colleagues at the Institute said when we gathered gathered our small group, they, we said, we are so few, but our meetings are so beautiful, how happy we are when we leave them. So th the other thing I want to tell you is that if we want to celebrate the Russian Revolution, the major challenge is to fight against capitalism. We need to build this collective political instrument. I myself, as many here, dedicated 40 years to organize a political structure in Brazil and the circumstances forced me to separate from that last uh, one year ago. And the party that I uh, was a member for so many years had split and 40 years is not 40 months or 40 weeks. And so we're building everything again, we're building a new party once again. I did not give up. I will continue to seek the path to build a revolutionary instrument in Brazil. And the third and last point that I would like to say is that NIEP, we should congratulate NIEP because they organized this uh, seminar. It's an internationalist event. The fact that we have Fred, Alex, and Kevin, and Lucia, I don't know if I'm forgetting any other one, and Ra uh, Ra 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 Rachel is already half Brazilian, but Ra Rachel too. So the fact that we have an internationalist event to honors the NIPS so long live the Russian Revolution. Thank you very much. Very well, we still have a half an hour uh, for a Q&A period. We have some questions. Yes, does someone has already the microphone. Good evening to all. My name is Erling. I am a professor in a place where I have the possibility to give a class in classrooms for the working class and I give classes in the Mukuri Valley that has the lowest human development index in the state of Minas Gerais at the Jitikonyoya Valley which was a very impoverished area. The interventions today in a certain way makes us to reflect a lot because maybe one of the reasons for us to discuss a Russian revolution it would be the main reason it would be how can we act today uh, in this counter-revolutionary moment that we live in of the growth, fascist growth in many uh, places. And my impression is that there's a demobilization of the working class and a critical thought vis-a-vis -vis in the world within the working class movement. So congratulations to, to the panel members. And I will take advantage of the, uh, the interventions and make a reflection. And you can comment, all of you, please, you contributed a lot for me to say the following. Today, the human being is not the reference of the majority of the left. Why do I say so? That, why do I say that? Because part of it that is critique, they forget when they demand for revolution that some rights mean food on the table and defeats as the one that we have today with the counter reforms against the labor laws in Brazil, the reform of labor, that impacted the immediate survival of the workers. Another part <coughs> of the left, in a certain way, does not have as a reference to human being because uh, Raquel brought elements for that. They forget when they make their demands that we are a class, that we demand for gender or demand for racial purpose or for racial issue, for the nation or for the ethnic group. At the same time today that reached the working class was not us, the Marxist. It was on one hand a, 
a, a player that gives us the hope for uh, uh, for us to survive in 2018. She's talking about Lula, and so we cannot dispute with this. <coughs> figure because uh, what the small policies brought to Brazil they put food on the table and in the second place for those that gave hope in a certain way it was the religion the Pentecostal religion in Brazil and the interior of Brazil gives a reason to live a resistant uh, reason to exist for the working class so how can we overcome these barriers within the left and that we continue with the ideological struggle to try to advance a little bit. That's the issue that I raise. More questions from the floor? The microphone, please. Good evening, my name is Edson. I have three issues to raise. The first question that I'd like to raise is in relationship to 1917 between June or July and October, considering or not the, the Gregorian calendar. I would like to know what were the strategies, the main strategies from the Bush books to take over power, because as Professor uh, Kevin said, uh, there was a moment of great evolution and uh, a great movement, the crisis, changes, transformations were going on, and the dispute for power was uh, very fearful in those days. So what were the strategies, the main strategies, the determinant strategies from the Bolsheviks to take over the power to their resurrection in, in October? The, uh, their insurrection. The other issue is the post-revolutionary period after, with the victory uh, of the internal counter-revolution, 1918, 1920, and 21, and then afterwards with the death of Lenin in, in 22. I don't know if it was the Professor Heikel talked about uh, the, the bureaucracy, emergence of the box, which would be the counter-revolution. The round table did not touch on this issue, and I think it's important to discuss this matter. Well, what was the defeat of the Russian Revolution that happened afterwards, in the aftermath of the revolution? I would like to know more details about that. And another question is just a more curiosity on my side. Professor Valerio mentioned that the leadership of the party, uh, the heads of the party, were the major core, the decision-making core, and Lenny, as all the other components of the committee, of the leadership of the party, were persecuted, and Ukraine was known as the most fearful or efficient political police and aggressive of Europe. How did they manage this leadership to survive for such a long time this repression without being killed or assassinated? Although uh, Lenny lived in exile, but he was not shot or he was not assassinated. So I, it's a personal question. How did they manage to survive against such a repression without being uh, shot or, or dead? There's a speaker list, it seems. A lot of people want to raise questions, but we don't have much time. So please be, is be brief in their questions, because we don't have much time. I would like to thank the panel members, the speakers. I am Mari from the another university, from the other valley. She's from the Murukuri. I come from the another valley, Jichi Kanyoi. I'm also a professor that I have in my classroom the working class uh, students. <laughs> They, uh, they are our students, they are working during the day, but they come to the university to study at night. It's a public university, a free university. And I'd like to raise another element to comment with Valerio, uh, maybe with Raquel and Professor M Kevin. May, uh, maybe this tragic moment that we've been facing, the Brazilian reality, a moment that seems to me that we still better understand, which was the general strike and the movements that we have uh, lately. So Valerio, if you could make a comment about this panorama in Brazil due to the uh, mobilization process, I know what to, 
what you colleagues from the, from other countries about the mobilization that we had in Brazil in the last months. I don't know if you had new, heard news, not in the size that we would wish, but it was quite intense. <coughs> that brings important elements for us to assess and to advance. Alex has the floor now. Bem, eu peço desculpa, eu não posso falar em português, mas eu apenas queria comentar sobre o paradoxo que, que o Valério se referiu sobre os argumentos do Trotsky, sobre que a Revolução de Outubro, de outubro não poderia ter acontecido sem o Lenin. E eu queria ressaltar dois pontos. Em primeiro lugar, eu acho que o Trotsky, não surpreendentemente, era um melhor marxista do que o Deutscher, mas o Deutscher, criticando o Trotsky, acaba invocando o fundador do uh, marxismo russo, Plekhanov, que argumenta que em cada situação revolucionária existe um líder. A história vai encontrar aquele líder. Portanto, se Lenin tivesse sido assassinado em julho de 1917, alguém mais teria emergido para assumir a luta e o papel de ganhar os bolcheviques para tomar o poder. E Trotsky se argumenta isso. Para mim, é muito difícil imaginar isso. Então, se nós rejeitarmos o entendimento de determinismo do marxismo, nós temos que aceitar que, às vezes, pode ser resultar a indivíduos, indivíduos é que podem fazer uma diferença. Se a gente é, rejeitar uma situação sobredeterminada que nós tínhamos no caso da Rússia, é, que nos levou a outubro de 17. O segundo ponto que eu quero levantar é que eu acho que é muito importante ver o papel de Lenin, não de apenas como sendo esse gênio que aparece e diz, ah, vamos tomar o poder. Não, Lenin foi capaz de tomar essa posição contra como a Valéria diz, a oposição de uma sessão significativa, de uma parte significativa do Partido Bolchevique, não apenas a, a, porque, na verdade, o que o Lenin argumentava correspondia a sentimento profundo da classe trabalhadora russa, e isso nos leva a alguma das coisas que o Kevin estava dizendo falando antes, o que o Lenin disse em abril, quando ele estabeleceu os motivos do poder soviético, se encaixava em como certas partes da classe trabalhadora pensava a mesma coisa verdadeira no, no final de 1917. Portanto, era a habilidade de Lenin em conjunção com muitos ativistas bolcheviques de se relacionar ao sentimento profundo dentro da classe trabalhadora russa, que permitiu que ele desempenhasse o papel importante que ele teve. Isso é muito importante para a política contemporânea, porque eu concordo totalmente com o Valério. Se você é um marxista, o teste de ser um marxista eficiente é de que está, como você se relaciona com as trabalhadoras e suas lutas. E isso é muito importante. E é a qualidade dessa relação nossa com a classe trabalhadora que permite que o Lenin desempenhe o papel que ele acabou desempenhando na Revolução 17. Good evening, my name is Marcio. I am a PhD student. I congratulate the, the, the speakers, the panel members. It's very important for us to have Marxists uh, discussing the Russian Revolution, and especially reclaiming that uh, Russian uh, Revolution. I would like to raise two questions to the panel members. The subjective factor that was approached by many uh, speakers, but the revolutionary process, I would like. Could you comment a little bit about the a bureaucratization process after the revolution, in which way we can see the Bolshevik party as an element itself of this process of bureaucratization, because today we have a historiography that says by different authors and even Vogart that the Bolshevik party was the architect of the Stalinist movement, and uh, uh, there was a mindset for the people in Russia for Stalinism that they were prepared to, but there's a Marxist literature that go against this vulgar, we can see a more sophisticated analysis which is certain positions and mistakes of the Bolshevik party operated as a for the process of bureaucratization for example the effort to have a more efficient industrial uh, sector for the war maybe that played some role in the bureaucratization which way can we actually say in a much more sophisticated way to think of the role of the Bolshevik party in the bureaucratization and link to this question another question 
In Kevin's book, you raised the assumption uh, uh, of uh, state capitalism and late capitalism in the prestige phases of the revolution. There's other f analysis of the sort in the field of Marxism and uh, representing better the Trotskyist position. I'd like to you to com comment a little bit in which way on the base of the evidence of Kevin in your research uh, and what we have today to think what would be the best theoretical instruments to think uh, the moments after uh, the revolution. Is it a state capitalism? Is it a bureaucratic state? What would be how do you position yourself in this theoretical debate of what uh, the aftermath of the Russian and the new evidence today that will sustain your theory or refute or rebut some of the theoretical base that we have analyzing the aftermath of the revolution? One more question for the floor. My name is José. Good evening. Two simple questions. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank all the panel members. The speakers were wonderful. My first question is, one is, uh, how do you see the states, the general state of the world revolution? What is the scenario or forecast? I know they are impossible, but anyway, we need the forecast anyway. And so what scenario do we find ourselves? And what are the objectives and subjective conditions to where you can manage to reach or more advanced or not? The second question, which is uh, going against this first question. We are a small group of intellectuals, Marxists, in a country of a third world, as they say. But uh, amongst us, we have petit bourgeois left uh, intellectuals as they exist around the world. So what is the impediment for us to get out of where we are, where we find ourselves enclosed in our small world to the larger world? Another question? And then we have to close the questions because it's very late now. Good evening. Well, it's just a telegraph question, a telegraph. I'm concerned with our time frame here. For Kevin, you mentioned about the role of the women in 1917 in February. And then the women play a very important role of protagonism in February, but this role of the women diminishes, and their protagonism starts declining as the women. And when it reaches October, they play another important role, but it's not the role of vanguard uh, and protagonist as it was in February. And then I would like you to comment a little bit about why do you think that it happened, all this movement or this shift, because during the year, the Bolshevik Party invested in many spaces to organize women. The laundry workers were organized, networking of the wives of the soldiers. There was or tried to organize uh, maids, housemaids. But in October, we're going to see we'll have an image of how they showed up in the revolution, quite different from the image that they were shown in February. I'd like to see what would your, be your assumption, your hypothesis about why this happened. <coughs> now he's off microphone, I'm sorry. We cannot hear him without the microphone. He needs the microphone. Well, it's a quick question. I think that it's a compliment a little bit which is raised. Valerio said that we lost the surprise factor once with the 17th revolution. And I believe that with everything that happened in the 20th century, this will be aggravated. So my question is a very simple one. What is the surprise factor for the 21st century? A simple question. Very well. Let's go back to our panel members. Let's follow the order of presentation. Let's start with Rachel, and then Kevin, and then uh, Valerio. Well, I'd like to focus on the first question, because I believe it's... You may have made some three or four references. What I want to say is that for more than 10 years, I am a revolutionary militant and I uh, worked 
close to workers organizations until 10, 11 o'clock I help them to write their, their journals and I worked uh, I travel around the world uh, and so not only in the university world at the individual level and there's a collective level amongst us at the collective level I know the difficulties that we face uh, there's a mismatch between the intellectuals and the cl working class and of course this happens and there's changes there's exceptions but ups and downs but this mismatch is a pertinent issue I believe it partially it's due to the fact that the social pact that is the working class that is our uh, historical subject is a working class that effectively has reached levels of safety in the workplace and I'm talking about objective conditions the working class itself in Europe in the aftermath of the GAF war in the US and in Brazil after the 80s it's a working class that has served as a wall to against the advance of revolutionary perspective because this working class that the objective conditions are very uh, tough. Sweden has some of the best unions that I work with, but I went to Sweden and asked, uh, where are the rich and the poor in Sweden, I asked. Because the degree of welfare state that some sectors of some classes in some countries in the world have reached, especially in the central countries, was unthinkable till 1945. And this happened because uh, it happened because of 60 million people that died in the Second World War. Now the second question is my optimism to the world revolution. Vis-a-vis -vis the world revolution is good because this working class is becoming impoverished. And so I believe that this could uh, uh, leverage the world revolution. The work that I do with the working class, with the port workers in the U.S., they earn $10,000 per month. The doctors in Portugal that earn three, four, five thousand, 5000 and became proletarians because the hospital today is a plant. This was not possible 20 years ago to organize these workers because today it's possible because their work is being precarious work. They're threatened today. And so the idea that they can also have a dialogue as an intellectual, as a revolutionary intellectual, there was uh, changes in their objective conditions. That's why they have a dialogue with me. I'm very optimistic because first, the working class productive working class of the central countries as finally being threatened by the accumulation conditions not in the last decades. The, the second uh, has to do with the impoverishment, the absolute uh, impoverishment, and the proletarization of other sectors. And I'm not saying this by the passion for a working class. The British miners went home, went, went with their salaries, and they got an indemnity, as it was uh, many other workers. And the bourgeoisie says that there's a sector of the working class that we cannot smash, smash. We have to win over them. The British miners were not won over with the repression. They were buyout. There was a buyout with welfare programs, with be social benefits, social programs. And so the industrial working class and productive uh, class after the Second World War, this is absolutely fundamental to explain the stability of capitalism because these classes better received a better standard of living. And the economic crisis of today is so strong that they're going to have to move over these uh, against these sectors and I have high hopes on that and and I don't think the Stalinism uh, what are the Stalinist parties today in Europe uh, they are the trade union they're the trade unions of the uh, Second World War uh, all the thems are in right one in Portugal they had one of the best communist uh, par communist parties in the world but the the union rate was 50 percent now uh, they are very limited in their action and they ask uh, subsidies for the economy and so there's an exhaustion there's an exhaustion of that kind of communist party and uh, so Stalinism the crisis of Stalinism does not come with the fall of the Soviet Union in my opinion it, it, it comes with much more intensity with the crisis of 2008 and the erosion of social rights of this social base that is uh, the, either the Stalinism in the south of Europe or the social democracy in the north of Europe 
The counter-revolution, I understand it very well, the bureaucratization, it's called uh, follow the money. That's how the Soviet Union it was a miserable country. There was money for us, minority, KKS, and the bureaucracy that had the means of life, and they, and they, uh, they made their move. What I do not understand, uh, and, and I am reading the uh, Victor Serge, and they, the, the bureaucracy, the Moscow trials, is that uh, how you some of these Bolsheviks develop that kind of figure in the Moscow trials? Not only those that were tortured, and uh, those that uh, were lambs that they knew that they would be that they would be assassinated, that they confessed their crimes, their so-called crimes. This is what makes me very sad, and to perceive this defeat that we had, this defeat from the interior during the Moscow trials, uh, and I'm I, and. Uh, and uh, this is something Andres Nid was uh, assassinated, but he refused to confess his so-called crimes, to say that he was a Trotsky to the enemy of Stalin and uh, of the regime. So he refused that. And here, we can see in Victor Serge's novel. Let me go to the last question that seems to me very interesting. It's an issue that I will answer it without says Valeria, we're in Petit Comité. I am a militant of a political party because I am a figure of obsessive uh, personality. Uh, being a member of a party is already something is, uh, you, you, uh, they, and so people think that they, uh, people that are ugly, to belong to a, par a party would be the worst place that we could belong to. And the party is a place where 99% of the activities are to discuss what we have to do here. And since I'm an intellectual that are passionate by ideas, the party for me is a nice place. The workers that are unionized that I work with, they don't attend the party meetings. They don't attend party meetings because that is a hostile place for them. And, uh, and, uh, and sometimes we had political discussions, but there were also uh, uh, theater plays, there was the ballroom, and to teach music to the working class. These things exist in the revolution. These were the first days. This is where you could learn music. It was in the party, uh, where the workers could be educated for attending the party activities. But the party is a reproduction are the bad quality of what we can do in the academic world. I'm talking about uh, the state, not in terms of strategy, because I agree with what Valeria said about the need of a political party, of the strategic party. And I believe that you can't be a revolutionary if you're not a militant of a party, uh, yeah, or be a doctor and you don't work in a hospital. That's impossible. Although I consider the, uh, the work that we do is very noble. Now, uh, you can't be a doctor and you don't you don't consider yourself to be a doctor and you don't treat the patient i want uh, to do both things yeah. well uh well anyway so i believe that uh, the Ken Roach uh, movie was shown here. I think this should be our ideal of a party. The party has to be why our house is beautiful and the party is ugly and smells bad because we succumb to a, a liberal idea of the party and especially of the mode of life uh, or way of life. The way of life is not part of our party anymore. And so our house is very nice, but the headquarters of the party is, uh, is horrible. And the party doesn't discuss our lives. They do not encompass our private lives. And this is very strange to the working class movement. The solidarity networks that the Pentecostal churches offer here, we would have to offer. If there's a poor worker that does not have food on the table, we we would have to help this uh, help that poor worker. But it's the Pentecostal church that helped the work, that work that doesn't have food. It's God that's helping. Can you believe that it's God that's doing this work? No one. I'm sure that no one uh, believes in God, but they, uh, they, they go to see the pastors because they know that they will uh, have people helping them to take care of their children. It's their lives. Why so? Because we, 
see we see, don't see the necessity for these kind of policies. Politics is is based on necessity. There's no artificial split between politics and necessity in the lives of people, and we don't make that merge. And uh, in our party, if the party has to be the the place where we want to bring in people. We will, we will not manage to win over the, class, the working class. You know why? And, and it's good it doesn't have because the working class is very intelligent. The working class, the organized, is very intelligent. That's why our parties are full of students. They don't have the slightest idea of working hours for a worker. We're full of people that are marginalized. And so our parties have everything because we're they're the only people that can have meetings at 10 o'clock at night because they they don't have to wake up early in the morning. They don't have children, small children waiting for them. And so while they have small children, they go to some private school and they, 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 they can pay. But the working class doesn't have all that. And so, and we even do more on top of that. What we, you know what we do? We go say to the working class the following liberalize the drugs uh, where if you live in the shanty town in Rio and can then come advocating for really liberalize the drugs or non criminalize the drugs that's one thing we're in favor we should not criminalize uh, we're against trafficking of drugs but and we can't say to the working class that it's going to be something wonderful we have a liberal policy that is fully strange to the working class, and that's why we then we don't understand why the working class doesn't follow us. And uh, I just end saying the following: When I went, my drama was in Portugal. So we have free school, but uh, from uh, three years of age. And so my problem was, as a mother, how can I raise again? I need a day center. Uh, I need a nurse 24 hours a day for side by my side. And you don't know what the left-wing party says? Well, that's gay marriage. In gay marriage, you can get that. There's no other theme in the family in the left wings. The left wing parties, they don't discuss family matters. And I'm in favor of gay marriage. But I'm actually against marriage as a whole. Uh, but this is another story for another day. So uh, anyone can want to marry, there's no problem. But this is politics. The main problem of the working class is to manage a family. And I don't know how they survive and they don't kill themselves to manage their work, their family, the children, to take care of all that, make food. And so the, the family issue is a central issue for the working class, but our relationship cannot say, let's destroy the family. No, we have to give solutions for the people's lives, concrete solutions for their lives. Uh, Bolsa Familia, the family stipend is a response, but it's a small response. There are many other issues that we have to solve in the family life because people have not that solved, and this has tortured their lives, this destroyed their lives. And, and I help a, f uh, a family that lives in the shanty town, and so you know what it is because you're Brazilians, you know the problem, the people that live in the shanty town is when they pick up a bus and they uh, and so they know they don't know know when there's going to be an assault uh, on the bus and so the, when they're not uh, uh, assaulted on the bus they should be relieved so this is the problem criminality is a concrete problem and so she's relieved when she can manage to get back we if we don't solve these uh, daily problems of the people, we will not manage to attach to the people because we don't live the concrete lives of concrete people. Um, yeah, so many questions. I'll try to answer a few of them. Questions are very good. I'll try to You better take your headset off, Kevin, otherwise you'll listen to a feedback. <laughs> Então, a primeira pergunta que eu queria responder era sobre as mulheres. Eu não falei sobre o movimento da grevista, mas o movimento grevista, mais tarde, no verão, tendeu a ser de empregados que trabalhavam na indústria têxtil, mulheres e trabalhadores não qualificados que lideraram os movimentos que ele visto no verão. Então eu peço desculpas por não ter mencionado isso, por a restrição do tempo, mas eu diria que o movimento das mulheres como tal, 
na verdade, decolou depois da Guerra Civil. As condições da Guerra Civil, onde a produção, na maior parte, em muitas fábricas, pararam totalmente as condições para construir o um movimento feminino vibrante. Não existiam essas condições. Então, no meu livro, eu falo sobre a organização das mulheres de 1922 até 1924, pela qual as mulheres de cada fábrica, e tem uma fábrica que eu estudei especificamente, elas tinham uma arena como essa, elas viriam e discutiriam as suas preocupações sobre como cuidar das crianças, saúde, como ter uma categoria melhor de salário, e havia um representante dos sindicatos e também do partido bolchevique nessas reuniões. Eles ouviam essas preocupações e eles respondiam positivamente. E o fato de que a maioria das mulheres na fábrica frequentavam essas reuniões, porque era voluntário a participação. Você podia ir numa reunião dessa porque você estava interessado, era voluntário. Mesma coisa aqui, como vocês estão aqui, a mesma coisa com a organização das mulheres. A maioria das mulheres na fábrica, e haviam 700 mil mulheres envolvidas nesse movimento. E elas iam a essas reuniões por uma boa razão, porque elas esperavam um resultado positivo. Infelizmente, à medida que a produtividade se tornou mais importante, mais tarde sobre o estalinismo, ou no começo da ONU, da NEP, as mulheres começaram a perder interesse nessas reuniões, porque a preocupação principal da administração das fábricas em 1927 era aumentar a produtividade da fábrica, que é uma coisa mais importante, que levou à derrota da Revolução Russa. Mas o movimento das mulheres em si mesmo, eu argumentaria que era muito vibrante em 1917, mas é um movimento sustentável que decolou realmente depois da Guerra Civil e não durou muito tempo. Bem, a outra pergunta sobre a derrota da Revolução Russa, bem, são grandes questões, provavelmente mereceria toda uma reunião em separado por si só para discutir isso. Eu vou apenas fazer alguns comentários muito rápidos. Eu argumentaria que você tem que começar desde o começo. Com o que os bolcheviques herdaram era uma catástrofe. Se você vê o que eles estavam tendo que argumentar, como é que você vai resolver isso, esse dilema do internacionalismo, o país mais atrasado que os nossos oradores falaram aqui antes, e eles estavam contando com apoio e houve uma revolução na Europa Central, na Alemanha, mas em vez dos trabalhadores virem a ajudar os trabalhadores, as classes dominantes da Europa e dos Estados Unidos vieram para ajudar os brancos, o exército branco, até o termo guerra civil é meio errado esse termo, porque nesses 3 mil generais oficiais é, que estavam na Ucrânia, a única maneira que eles podiam criar um exército era literalmente através de milhões de dólares em apoio que eles recebiam do mundo ocidental, dos poderes ocidental. Sem o apoio do Ocidente, do de, não haveria guerra civil na Rússia. Na verdade, é uma guerra imperialista contra o regime socialista. Portanto, a internacional solidariedade de um lado e você ter a solidariedade da classe dominante contra a Revolução Russa, aí vocês podem ver é, como é que qualquer, tem bons textos que falam sobre isso, que o período entre 1914 até 21 e a fome continua até 1923, 13 milhões morreram de fome. Ah, isso é 18% antes da guerra. A burocracia, uma pergunta sobre a burocratização. A burocracia tinha 5 milhões de empregados pagos. Mais pessoas trabalhavam mais para o governo, cinco vezes mais trabalhavam para o governo, comparado com a classe industrial trabalhadora. E o Lenin, você está falando sobre, então, você também tem que lembrar que os bolcheviques eram contra a guerra, mas a produtividade na Improtegrado era 85% produtividade para a guerra. Portanto, você está falando de uma economia de guerra. Mesmo nas melhores circunstâncias, você tem que reorientar toda a economia novamente, infelizmente, para os bolcheviques. Eles tiveram que reorientar a, a economia para a guerra civil. Portanto, nós estamos falando de uma catástrofe absoluta Bolcheviques e o regime sobreviveram, mas de uma maneira bastante distorcida. O Lênin usa o termo o estado dos trabalhadores com distorções burocráticas, com deformações burocráticas. Eu acho que é bom ver, pensar 
como no modelo bonapartista, que o Trotsky fala, apesar de que ele usa o termo mais tarde, eu acho que no período da década de 20, existem tendências diferentes entre os bolcheviques, e eu discuto algumas das tendências positivas no meu livro, ou seja, a organização das mulheres, os sindicatos, e o, isso é baseado na posição do Lenin, nós temos que ter sindicatos que defendam os trabalhadores mesmo contra o seu próprio Estado. Se você ver o programa do que os projeviques implementaram depois da guerra civil, porque o, o argumento, o, o exército branco é derrotado, mas a revolução não pode ganhar. Eu acho que a posição marxista seria a seguinte, que dadas as circunstâncias concretas da catástrofe que os bolcheviques herdaram, eles se saíram muito bem. Os trabalhadores conseguiram aumento de salário real, houve aí a organização das mulheres, os trabalhadores tinham seus direitos, e até 1925, 26 eles ganhavam o mesmo salário que eles recebiam em 1914, mas eles o faziam trabalhando apenas oito horas por dia. Então, houve uma legislação progressista que foi instituída nesse período da Revolução. Mas, por outro lado, não é um uniforme que aconteceu depois da Revolução. Existem tendências, pressões diferentes acontecendo. Uma delas é o desejo de aumentar a produtividade do trabalho, que essencialmente significava, a longo prazo, enfraquecer os comitês de fábrica dos trabalhadores e os sovietes. Os sovietes, na verdade, se distorceram desde, desde o começo. Para ser honesto, como instituição democrática da classe trabalhadora, por causa que os outros partidos políticos eram contra o poder soviético, os bolcheviques logo cedo, é, e você já pode ver em 1918, 19, o partido substituiu os sovietes. Então, para responder a uma questão muito complexa que você levantou sobre a natureza do regime, eu diria que na NEP havia ambiguidade. Todo mundo usa o modelo bonapartista, outros dizem que era um sistema estatista, outros a favor dos trabalhadores. Eu acho que na burocracia existe uma parte da burocracia que é a favor da classe trabalhadora. Em 1928, quando Stalin ataca o capazinato e organiza a coletização forçada pela qual 5 milhões de camponeses morrem com a coletização forçada. E quando ele ataca a classe trabalhadora, que ele transforma esses comitês de fábricas e esses sindicatos em algo que, nome, nome, que tinha defendido os trabalhadores e ele transforma elas em instituições que atacam os trabalhadores e, e é pra, busca apenas aumentar a produtividade. É aí que você pode dizer que existe, que isso não é mais um regime, que a conexão entre 17 e 21 não há essa conexão mais. E o que está acontecendo nesse momento, quando eles estão matando literalmente milhões de camponeses e estão destruindo a reminiscência no, do poder dos trabalhadores no local de trabalho, eu acho que isso realmente é uma grande mudança, 17 para 28. E agora sobre a questão da estratégia bolchevique, em 1917, de julho até outubro, eu posso dizer que, genericamente falando, essa noção de todo o poder aos soviéticos do Lenin e o poder soviético, eu acho que esse é um tema que uh, existe a partir de abril, mas Lenin usa esse moto como uma opressão tática, como um meio tático. Uh, houve um período em agosto que ele diz todo o poder aos comitês de fábrica, porque eles estavam começando a perder confiança nos soviéticos. Então, eu vou terminar em dois minutos. E, portanto... Há um conceito de poder aos soviéticos, mas também há questões estéticas. O Lenin argumentou durante um período de tempo que nós tínhamos que estar propensos, e isso depois de Kornilov, do general Kornilov e seu gol, golpe de Estado, e a estratégia de compromisso foi esmagada. Então, Lenin levantou o argumento que nós devemos fazer uma solução de compromisso com o Menchevique. Se o Menchevique toma o poder, nos permita organizar e, criticamente, nós vamos permitir vocês governarem, se vocês nos permitirem organizar os trabalhadores. Era uma solução de compromisso que o Lenin está procurando. Muitas questões aconteceram em 1917. Você não pode colocar um selo do Lenin em tudo. Você pode dizer que geneticamente que os bolcheviques ainda estavam a favor do poder aos soviéticos e no meio de setembro, para Lenin, a razão pela qual ele abandonou essa noção de uma solução de compromisso com os bolcheviques, porque as duas principais cidades, Moscou e Petrogrado, o, o, tinham maioria bolchevique. E outras cidades estavam indo nessa direção. Portanto, nós estamos falando de um processo em movimento. Portanto, não é fácil colocar 
um selo fácil em cada uma. Essa direção era para a esquerda. E no meio de setembro, Lênin está dizendo, não, não mais compromisso, não mais concessões. Eles estão no lado errado. E você podia ver isso, uma série de questões que aparecem em setembro e outubro. Os mencheviques estão ficando do lado dos contra-revolucionários. Portanto, uma resposta simplista é todo o poder aos soviéticos, mas isso é um pouco simples demais. Obrigado. É, pessoal, a faculdade tem que fechar às 10 e é pessoal. Well, the gates of the university close at 10 p.m. and they need some more time to close the auditorium. So we really, I will use two minutes because we only have 12 minutes and we'll go on tomorrow. So two questions I will answer. Uh, the, your question about the illusions of the Brazilian working class. Lula, the neo-Pentecostal churches. In Sao Paulo, there's a very dangerous religion, which is the Corinthian soccer fans. And they contagiate other regions of the country, too. So that's a altered state of mind. And it, things can get worse, I know. But anyway, back to illusions. Illusions are always transitional in history. I know that when we come closer to the working class uh, as they are, and especially when we come close to disorganized groups in the wor working class, then the delay, uh, delayed state of mind is terrible. So I'm not only worried about the illusions of the religious groups, but the reformists, or rather the idea that life can be better without fighting against the uh, status quo, that is the big problem in my view. I think that we will have no chance whatsoever of um, causing a split in the workers' movement and bring about the Brazilian re revolution. It will have to be caused by the younger generation from the city and from the rural areas with religious convictions. But these reforms illusions, they are not immortal. The practical experience has a brutal impact on the awareness of millions. So the objective factors need to become more serious before anything happens. And this will lead me to my second and last answer, which is which will be to your question. So I'm answering the first and the last questions that were asked to me. So your question was the classical, fundamental question that comes up in any true market Marxist uh, debate, which is how do we bring up revolution? And thank you for that, because after nine questions, nobody had asked it, and you saved my honor. <laughs> So there is a relationship between that and the first question. The first question is, what is the expiry date of these illusions? We're in a hurry. So it's historical patience. Nothing replaces the actual movement of the experience of what hundreds or millions of peoples. Uh, it doesn't mean that what we say is not important, but they need to experience it. All these revolutionary ideas and trends in the working class, your effort in interacting and organizing strikes and committees, every, all that is important, but it does not replace the experience of millions because it's not only impossible to win over 100 million, but it's also very hard. It doesn't, it's not worthwhile to get to power if the working class does not join you, doesn't not uh, join you in maintaining it. We don't want a Paris commune in Brazil. That's the first thing, historical patience. Now, two more things that are even more important. And whoever understands this will always find the strength to continue the fight. The first idea is that capitalism will never leave us in want. 
uh, capitalism does threaten civilized life. And in the next time, they won't be able to use their quantitative easing. Uh, the s major countries have already uh, gone beyond 100% of the GDP in, in their indebtedness. This transfer to the future, uh, pushing up to the future, fighting liquidity with liquidity, this has a limit. Capitalism threatening civilized life when in the richest, more powerful country with the more complex cultural critical mass of the world, a person, delirious person like Trump comes to power threatening North Korea with nuclear we uh, weapons saying that they w he will use military resources against uh, another country. When we come to this point, this is anticipating an apocalyptic future that lies ahead for us. There is a catastrophic element in Marxism. It does include this. Marx, really, when he found in studying the metabolism of capitalism, he found the trend for self-destruction. He says that when capitalism reaches its apex, it will itself create the forces that will destroy it. However, Marx also shows us with historical experience that although capital will destroy itself, bourgeoisie will not commit suicide. And my second element and last argument is that the working class will end up fighting, and they will fight even more than they have in the past. No social class commits suicide, or simpoku, as the Japanese say, the, or harakiri. They will all, s they will rise, and the crisis will bring larger and larger groups especially the mo the bravest and most intelligent they will start to act and they in reaction to the attacks and offenses they suffer we saw on april 28th for the first time after decades in brazil a, a general strike strike that hadn't happened since the 80s since 89, the impact that this strike had on the bourgeoisie was not small. They were able to see the leaders. They know that the leaders don't want to subvert the order in Brazil, but they saw an objective movement, movement that is very powerful. And the class itself, the working class itself, also realized its own power. But the revolutionaries will say, look at the, how strong we are. We cannot strike for only one day. We have to go on for a week until the social welfare system is uh, broken down. But look, we stopped and the factory next door did not stop. And that brings a lot of insecurity. The political struggle does not have a defined outcome. It depends on willingness, on the initiative of the revolutionaries. So it is the surprise factor that we have for, for the 21st century. It is comrades, that we know more. We have learned from the lessons of the 20th century. If we have the same uh, willingness and decision-making power that we ha have, we still stand a chance, although small. But it's worth fighting for. Thank you.